tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. What the fuck was that? Oh my god. Boss, the back again. Boss. Boss! Oh, I love this song. As a teenager, I discovered I was a night owl. I blame the internet partially, but also there was a weird thrill associated with being awake while the rest of the world slumbers. You feel like an explorer glimpsing something few people have ever seen. Granted, most of the time growing up, the only thing I glimpsed during those hours were video games and porn. Oh. Shut your Ooh. dirty little mouth. <sighs> Did you get my point? It's unnatural to be nocturnal as a human. There's a thrill to being out of step with the natural order. To that end, I started working the overnight shift at the front desk of a hotel. While there isn't a ton of people who come breezing in at those hours, you see more traffic than you'd imagine. It mainly was exhausted road-tripping families looking for a place to catch some Z's before the next leg of their sojourn or couples meeting up for a clandestine <laughs> affair with lust clouding their eyes. It's always easy to spot a cheating couple. Still, there was enough of them to keep you busy. Not overworked, but steady. While I had never intended hotel work to be a career, I did find a lot of joy in the work. And as an added bonus, I was really good at it. About a year into the gig, the big boss sat me down and asked me what my plans were post-college. I said I thought I might move to the coast and look for work that would take advantage of my major. At that time, it was psychology. But everything was up in the air at that moment. Listen, Eric. The big boss told me that if I wanted, we really need there like would be a night manager position opening up at a property the owner just purchased in Cincinnati. Can we count on you? The starting pay was great. Hello, Joe. It had tremendous benefits. What do you say? And if I had huh? a degree in hospitality hey, management, like my you. pay could double in the first year. What do you think? I had no real love for psychology, nor any real job prospects in the field at that time. Plus, the idea of grad school had started to fill me with dread. I decided that I would take the plunge and go for it. I shook the big boss's hand and my new career path was set. Welcome to the team, son. In a year, I'd be the night manager at a newly renovated hotel in a major city. I was thrilled. A year later, I packed up my stuff and moved to Cincinnati. Built in 1922, the Pullman Hotel was a vintage building that had once been the city's crown jewel, but had since fallen into disrepair. What once was the town's hotspot with a lively big band and a front page style gallus had become a flop house. It catered to transients staying Very week to week or prostitutes staying hour to hour. Hey, baby. The guts of the building looked like an open sore that never totally scabbed over. But the facade on the outside could still catch you by surprise. It had that 20s art deco look that made even the Dravis office building stand out. Where the Pullman was located, it shined like a diamond in a pile of trash. But urban renewal was becoming all the rage, and gentrification came calling. Soon, all the dilapidated buildings nearby started to change owners, and construction crews shared the streets with unhoused people's tents. My new boss bought the Pullman for a song and took a buffer's rag to that dull diamond. The transformation was impressive. The Pullman looked as glamorous as the day it first opened. My boss took special care to keep the decor as accurate to the air as possible, while adding modern touches. It worked. The local press went gaga for the restoration and soon the Pullman was filling up with travelers from all over the country. The shift in the population of the surrounding area had happened. As always, working class people were priced out of a place they had lived in for decades as rich white yuppies moved in. 
As if to put an exclamation point on the whole gentrification endeavor, a Starbucks opened around the corner. While the Pullman filled with new staff, there were a lot of holdovers from the previous regime. My boss thought these people knew the hotel at its worst and deserved to see it at its best. I found that touching. That was something they didn't have to do, but it engendered goodwill to mostly new staff. The first three months went smoothly. I loved the night shift, and the crew was great. We all got along and kept the Pullman humming. I genuinely loved my night security crew. A few were holdovers from the other owners, and we just clicked. They had hundreds of stories from their time serving at the flop house. Some wild shit happened in the old Pullman. Omar, the head of security, liked to talk about the guests who checked in but never checked out. It was his clever way of saying ghosts. He said the building was filled with them. A lot of people died in the hotel during his flop days. Omar yeah. mentioned that even after five years on the job, he still got goosebumps while doing his nightly rounds. He was glad for the security cameras that the new owner had installed. It meant he didn't have to brush up against Spectre so often. I love the stories Omar told, but I thought they were just that. <laughs> stories. I don't believe in anything paranormal, especially ghosts. Oftentimes, the evidence people mentioned where ghosts were all explainable. Orbs were just dust or bugs. Dark figures were just shadows that hit the right way. Voices picked up by spirit boxes or EVP recordings were just our brains trying to make sense of random electrical noise. Most ghostly faces were just everyday objects and tricks of light. Face pareidolia is hardwired into our brains. We seek out faces that look like us. Ever seen a face in a piece of toast or a tree? It's your brain looking for others like you. Nothing more. But Omar was a true believer. He told me about all the times he saw strange shit in the hotel. There was the time he saw a disembodied hand open the emergency exit door on the second floor. Or the time he heard what sounded like people laughing in the empty downstairs boiler room. My favorite was the time he was climbing down an access ladder in the basement and saw a face staring at him in the room below. What the fuck? Hell no! Oh shit, 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 shit. Bro, I damn near shit myself when I saw that face. I shot up that ladder faster than a fucking rocket. <laughs> As I said, Omar had a million stories about the Pullman, and he loved sharing them with the staring down times. But while each story was different, they always started the same way. It's a cold spot. That's when you know they're there. He'd say, shaking his head. That's when I bug the fuck out before someone shows up and haunts my ass. I told him it was probably just our ancient AC system acting up. While the old Pullman had been a ghost haven, nothing out of the ordinary had happened since the renovations. Like the transients, the spirits had seemingly moved on. Apparently we'd thrown them out with the old rotted furniture. Omar said he was shocked things were quiet, but he didn't believe they'd stay that way. They'll come back. Believe that. I didn't. One of the things I had taken to doing about halfway through my shift was to walk the hotel. For one, it was nice to leave my office and stretch my legs. Secondly, it was good to have non-security employees walk the floors, so people know someone is always around if they need help. Finally, you really get to know the hotel when you walk the grounds. All the little alcoves and hiding spots. Places where you can add a vending machine or where kids would hide from security. Or where you should put a camera. G.I. Joe told us knowledge is power. And I always trusted the Joes. Last week it seemed like the world was caving in at work. Everyone goes through those times when it feels like all you gotta do is stand up to keep going. But some pissed off god keeps sending hurricane winds to knock you back to earth. That was me last week. We had a power glitch on Monday that screwed up the air conditioner units. Some floors got blasted with ACs and others got none. On Tuesday, someone busted the lock on the side door on the ground floor, which anyone could walk into. Wednesday, our credit card system went down for a few hours and caused havoc with check-ins and checkouts. It was a mess. Go back. Omar told me on Thursday night, not ghosts, gremlins. We're being besieged by gremlins. Nah, Gizmo was cool. This is ghosts. Ghosts broke the lock on the door. Ghosts busted the AC unit. Good. Anything's possible. Not that. 
Until it happens to you, everyone thinks that. Honestly, I'd love to blame ghosts. At least then I'd have a reason why we're having this run of bad luck. Careful what you wish for, bro. Changing gears, he gave me a big smile. We're gonna go grab some Taco Bell. You want anything? Aren't you supposed to do your rounds now? I did it earlier. I'm due for my break. You want something or not? Of course I want something. I said with a smile. The usual? Yeah. I said, handing him over some cash. He nodded and pocketed it. New guy Martin is watching the cameras. He's good for a few. I'll take your word for it. Thanks, Chief. Omar said with a fist bump. Be back in a few. He headed out and I plopped back down in my chair. <sighs> I knew I shouldn't eat anything late at night, let alone Taco Bell. Still, a spicy potato taco and a chicken quesadilla would be the calming balm I needed to take the edge off this shitty week. I spun in my chair, trying to center myself when I heard a knock at the office door. Damn! Was there no line at the bell or what? It wasn't Omar. It was Gwen. She worked the front desk and was probably my most capable employee. She could run this place in my stead and there would be no noticeable drop-off. If Gwen was in here, something was amiss. Sorry, Gwen. I said, ceasing my spinning. Omar went to Taco Bell. Oh, I know. I got a bean burrito. A classic. I said for reasons I'm still not sure of. Ah. What's up? Um, someone from the second floor was complaining about noises in the hallway. Okay. Did you call security? Yeah, but Martin, well, I think he accidentally shut off the whole system. He's kind of flipping out. Not sure he's the face we want in front of the customers at the moment. Of course. Okay, I'll go take a look. Do you have a walkie I can borrow? Mine's still charging. Sure, let me go grab it. A few minutes later, I left for the lobby for the second floor. Now, the second floor is a bit of a misnomer because our second floor is actually at street level. In most modern hotels, the entire street level floor would be just a lobby, bar, and a ballroom. But the Pullman isn't like most buildings. Our second floor is comprised of a small lobby and hotel rooms. Our ballrooms and bar are below street level, or the first floor as our elevator calls it. Below that is the basement, where the laundry and the other hotel operations are located. Why the wonky labeling system? Well, when the building was first built, they took to calling the basement the first floor and the street level the second. Why? Well, the guy who made the first building had some weird beliefs about numbers in the stars, or some such nonsense. I think the bars were built in the basement because of prohibition, but I could never confirm that. I asked the new owner about it once, but it seemed he didn't know either. He told me he wasn't going to change anything because he didn't want to anger the spirits of the previous owners. He was another Omar. If it were up to me, hotel operations would be the sub-basement, the first floor would be the basement, and the second floor would be the main. You know, a common sense approach to everything. But alas, I'm just the night manager. Those decisions happen way above my pay grade. The Pullman is an architecturally pretty building on the outside, but it's also just a big square. I figured I'd start where the guests had first heard the disturbance, and make the walk until I came back where I started. Along the way, I'd check the doors to ensure they were working properly. Hopefully, Omar would come back and fix the cameras, and we would catch whoever was running around. When I opened the door to the floor, I felt the cold piping in. The second was one of those cold floors the broken AC was assaulting. At times, the AC seemed to shift, which floor was cold and which wasn't. The tech we had out on Monday had never seen the kind of behavior we had, but assumed it had something to do with the computer system. We were still waiting for a computer specialist to come take a look at the software. In the meantime, I would freeze on the second floor. <laughs> I started humming along to a Phoebe Bridgers song, Savior Complex for those keeping score at home, as I strolled to the room that had made the distress call. I hesitated to knock on their door, but I knew they were still up. I rapped on the door and waited a few minutes. I could hear the people inside shuffling and murmuring. I was pretty sure I had just interrupted sex or the prelude to sex. The door cracked open to a shirtless, disheveled man who was none too pleased to see me. What? Uh, sorry to bother you. I know it's late, but you called about the noise, correct? Yeah, Colombo. You solved it. I forced a smile and continued. I was wondering if you could tell me where the noise was located. The hallway. 
Like I said to the broad up front. Yes, but like, what was the noise? Running? Voices? Shouting? All of it. <laughs> Back and forth for ten straight minutes. Um, what were they saying? I don't know. I had a hard time making out anything. Some bullshit, I'm sure. Sounded like dumbass kids. Okay. People don't know how to take care of their fuck prices these days. I heard the woman he was with admonishing him for the colorful expression of children. He grinned and shook his head. She hates it when I talk like that. <laughs> Ain't that right, Dom? I'll leave you two alone. Thanks for your... The man shut the door in my face. I took that as my cue to go find the fabled fuck prizes roaming my hotel halls. I was sure if it was kids, they would be back in the rooms by now. It was late in the evening, and even the most unaware parents made sure the kids got to sleep. Regardless, it was my job to walk the chilly hallways of my Hoth Hotel and find these rogue tauntauns. I turned the first corner of the big square and heard someone whispering in front of me. So many people. I stopped and cocked so my ear in the direction of the whispers. They suddenly ceased. I faked walking a few steps and stopped to hear if the voices would start up again. But they didn't. I started walking again, continuing to whistle my way through Phoebe Bridger's Punisher album, when I heard what sounded like four or five footsteps running down the next hallway. I ran to the corner in time to see the stairwell door close. Whoever was there was trying to hide on the stairs. Or that's what they wanted me to think. This wasn't my first radio, and I knew kids always tried to pull a fast one on adults. Especially adults that were in an authority position. I suddenly shuddered at the thought that I was considered an authority figure. I felt my youth tip over and start to spill out of me at that moment. Just then, from the door at the end of the hall, I saw a figure move. Now, these doors lead to the outside and are made with frosted glass, so I couldn't make out details, but I believe it was probably some of the kids trying to do an end around. The game was on. Is Omar back? Static. And then I heard the unsure Martin respond. He's not. He's uh, in the bathroom, I think. Martin, I know he went to Taco Bell. You don't have to cover for him. Oh, then, then no. He's stuck behind the lady he thinks is ordering everything on the menu. Great. Any chance those security cameras are up and working again? I, uh, after I accidentally turned them all off or whatever, I'd feel better just waiting for him. Sorry, boss. I just don't want to make things worse. I get it. Just let me know when Omar gets back, okay? Will do. I looked up at the frosted door at the end of the hall and stared it down. If they made it outside... They could only get back in through the lobby. These doors locked behind you. I would have called Gwen to tell her, but I was holding her walkie. I was sure she'd notice a gaggle of kids walking in at this hour. I glanced over at the door to the stairs. I knew I should probably check the stairwell because there was a good chance they had darted down the stairs to hide. I would if I was a kid and someone was following me. I was just about to swing open that door when I suddenly remembered another spot they might be hiding that was closer. About ten feet from me was a small alcove where we kept the ice and the vending machines. I can't tell you the number of times I found someone behind the machines trying to vape or get frisky during the night shift. A few times Omar had found a former guest of the old Pullman trying to break into the vending machines. They wait by the outside doors for smokers and dash in before the door closes. There was a fair to good chance that's where they were. However, if they were clever and their kid radar worked, they'd spot an even better place to hide. Behind the machines is a hatch for a small crawl space. It's an access spot for some AC ducks on the first floor. It was a tight fit to get in, but once you got in and down the ladder, there was a lot of room. Granted, it would be pitch black, but that would help if you were hiding. I decided to skip the stairs and head for the vending machines. I took three steps towards it when from behind, <laughs> I heard laughing coming from the stairwell. I turned and lunged at the door. I ripped it open, half expecting to see a gaggle of preteen boys, it's always boys, laughing at me. But instead, I saw nothing. 
I checked behind the door and even under the landing on the first floor, but I didn't see hide nor hair of anyone. I was stumped. I knew I heard a laugh. It just didn't make any sense. I walked back into the hallway and let the heavy stairwell door slam behind me. Suck a crow's cock! <laughs> that was the trigger. I suddenly heard someone trying to stifle a laugh. Then two people. Then a group of boys started laughing uncontrollably. It was from behind the vending machines, just like I thought. I walked over there and found four boys red-faced with laughter. Hey guys. <laughs> they started laughing harder. I couldn't help but smile. It was contagious. Even though I was technically the authority figure here, I was still human. Was it what I said? Yes. yes. <laughs> That's why I said it. I knew you wouldn't be able to not laugh. Come on, let's get out from there. I moved out of the way and let him slide out from behind the machines. As they were passing, I nodded down at the crawl space hatch. I'm glad you guys didn't go down there. I didn't want to climb down a ladder in the dark. We were going to, but we heard someone down there. We thought it was security. There isn't anyone down there. We all heard someone walking and talking down there. It was probably just the AC making noise. It's not working correctly. That's why it's so cold on this floor. It didn't sound like AC. It was. Where did the kids on the stairs and running around outside go? They all looked at each other confused. The big kid was about to respond, but then we all heard footsteps coming down the hall. The kids looked up at me in fear, and for half a second I was scared too. David, are you and your brothers down there? The big kid recognized the angry voice. They all did. The jig was up. Mom had arrived on the scene. I stepped out from the vending machines and the four kids followed behind me. The mom and I had locked eyes. Uh, they were playing hide and go seek. She ignored me and zeroed in on the small group of boys. What in the world were you four thinking, sneaking out of the room and running around the hotel? They weren't too loud, I said, trying to soften the blow. Thank you for finding them. I I'm sorry if they caused any problems. I can't believe they snuck out. It's not a problem. I said turning on the manager charm. <laughs> we all did stupid things as kids. She feigned a laugh and pointed back towards her room. <laughs> all right, let's get going, boys, now. They all hung their heads and started back towards the room. Mom and I locked eyes again, and she sighed. <sighs> Thanks again for being so understanding. Uh, sorry if they ruined your shift. Nah, they gave me something to do. Enjoy the rest of your night. Thanks, you too. She said that she turned and joined her four dejected-looking boys. She stared down at them and shook her head. What am I going to do with you four, huh? Sorry. 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 They all said in unison. I figured this wasn't the first time they had done something like this. Mom, do you want to hear what that hotel guy said about crows? I turned to leave to avoid any side eye from Mom from my previous outburst, when I heard something bump the wall from behind the vending machines. Confused, I thought there might be another rogue group of boys sneaking around. The other boys had said they heard someone down there. I sighed and headed toward the crawl space. I squatted down and put my ear to the cover. I couldn't be sure, but I thought I heard something moving down there. It was hard to make out anything for sure with the cover on. I knew I would have to remove the hatch to get a better look. I pulled out my multi-tool and unfastened the screws. When all four were out, I gingerly grabbed the hatch cover and pulled it away. As soon as I did, you could feel a blast of cold air coming up from the room below. There had to be a leak in these ducts. I made a mental note to tell the repair guy when they returned. I cocked my ear towards the darkness and listened. I didn't hear anything now. No shuffling. No talking. Nothing. I pulled out my cell and turned on my flashlight. I pointed it down the shaft and onto the floor below. My camera's light struggled to illuminate much of the area. I leaned my head into the hole to get a better look. That's when I heard someone start loudly knocking behind me. I tried to rise up, but I forgot I was leaning into the hole and slammed my head on the hatch opening. I nearly god dropped my it. phone down the shaft of the room, but by the grace of God, I held on. I pulled myself out of the crawl space and from behind the vending machines. Rubbing the back of my head, I glanced down the hallway and saw a figure standing just outside the frosted glass door. I knew I had seen someone outside earlier, and now they were knocking to be let in. My guess was this was another group of kids who realized they had been locked out of the hotel. 
I started down the hall and pulled my walkie up to ask about the security cameras again when the figure standing outside waved at me. That was when I realized the figure was an adult and they were trying to get my attention. I waved back and hastened my pace. Someone probably went outside for smoke and forgot their key. As I said, it happens all the time. I got to the door and cracked it open. There was an older woman. I picked her in her mid-fifties, standing outside with an embarrassed look on her face. She was wearing vintage clothes that were out of style but looked right on her. She had blonde hair with gray streaks and the most piercing green eyes I'd ever seen. Her face was cherubic and pleasant, but you could see the red of embarrassment coloring her cheeks. Hey there, I said opening the door wide to let her in. I got turned around. She said walking in. Thank you for helping me. Um, no problem. Did you forget your key? Y yes If I had a dime for every time someone stepped outside for smoke and forgot their key, I could retire. I'd love to retire. She said with a faint smile. What do you do if you don't mind me asking? From behind me, the door to the stairwell slammed shut. I spun around, hoping to catch who was playing on the stairs, but I didn't see anyone. There might still be another group of kids out here. Is this the Pullman? Yes. It looks so different. We just went through major renovations. Have you stayed here before? Oh yes, uh, many years ago. We tried to keep some of the charm of the old place, but updated. How did we do? She didn't respond at first. I thought maybe she hadn't heard me, but when I looked at her, she looked lost. Like I could see her eyes, but they were dulled. I wondered if she had a mental illness and maybe was off her meds. I knew the state-run hospitals made a habit of dropping off discharged patients in this area. Are you feeling okay? That question didn't seem to penetrate her shields either. I was about to call for help when she finally stopped drifting and righted her course. I've seen so many things. She finally said, not breaking her gaze with mine. So many horrible things. Drugs! She was probably on drugs as well. It made the most sense. She said she was familiar with the Pullman, but hadn't been here in a while. Maybe she used to score at the old place and had been away for a time. I had to be careful because you never know how an addict might respond. Especially if they're mentally ill and off medication. Hopefully not here. <laughs> I said in light as a tone as I could muster. There are so many dark things here. She said, looking lost again. I feel drawn to them. It's why I stay here. <sighs> Is there someone I can call to help you? <laughs> she started laughing. It came on small like a joke that took a minute to land, but then grew into a full-on fit. She doubled over and held her stomach and laughed. I took a step back and started scanning the hallways for some help or a way out of there. Then she stopped as if someone had flipped a switch. She looked at me and shot me a warm smile. Is Wallace still here at this time of night? I... Uh... I, I don't know of any Wallace that works here. Did he used to work at the hotel when you used to come? He owned the place. I had known the names of the previous two owners, and neither of them was named Wallace. I wasn't sure if anyone who had ever owned this place was named Wallace. I was sure I was dealing with a mentally unwell person at that point. I wanted to ensure they got the help they needed. I also needed to get them out of my hotel before something bad happened. Bad PR could kill a new place as quick as a bullet. Maybe we can see if we can find them in our directory up front. Can you follow me to the lobby? So many people died here. Wallace hurt so many people. Uh, I didn't know what to say. While my brain searched for a response, I heard the squawk of my walkie coming to life. A familiar voice came across the walkie. It was Omar. Hey, boss, what's going on? I pulled up my walkie and smiled at the woman. <laughs> give me a second. Yeah, give me a second. I told her before I took a few steps away, turned my back to her, and pressed the button to respond. About the time you got back, Omar. Playing Taco Bell. Who are you talking to? Someone that may or may not be a guest in the hotel. I might need you down here to help. Boss, what are you talking about? What, what, what don't you understand? You see us, right? You fixed the security cameras. 
Yeah, but... So what are you confused about? I need help with this lady. She may be lost or... Uh, mentally ill or on drugs or something. She seems out of it. I'm afraid she might get... Omar cut me off. Ah, there isn't anyone there with you. The air went out of the room. I felt my skin go prickly all over. My head felt fuzzy, like I'd just done whippets. My mouth had dried in an instant and my tongue felt foreign in my mouth. What are you... I was calling to ask if you're okay because you're talking to yourself. Omar, I was talking to... I turned back and saw an empty hallway. I glanced in both directions but didn't see a trace of the person that had been standing there. The hair on the back of my neck stood up. Oh, you okay? Omar's voice sounded a million miles away. I thought I might black out. None of this made sense. My legs started to wobble, but I caught myself. I looked around again, but it was futile. I was alone in the hallway. There are so so many dark things here. There are so many dark things here. I heard a disembodied voice say. It sounded like it was coming from all around me. Then right next to my ear, the woman whispered. So many people. Then I heard footsteps run down the hall away from me. Not just a pair, but what sounded like dozens. They pounded on the ground, sounding like a herd of elephants on the march. Then I heard the laughter again. <laughs> I stood frozen in place, unable to process anything. I heard a room door whip open and saw the pissed off man I spoke to earlier come bursting into the hallway. He was completely naked, and it was apparent his good time had been interrupted. But now he had the look of murder in his eyes. He saw me at the other end of the hallway and yelled, That's these fucking kids and keep quiet! I'm trying to ball my old lady! Just then, he was violently pushed back into his room by some unseen force. Something cackled as the naked man tumbled to the ground. His door slammed shut by itself. And I was sure he wouldn't come back out. Or at all, if I'm being honest. The vending machine suddenly tipped over and slammed into the ground with a glass shattering crunch. I saw the cover to the crawl space opening fly out and slam into the opposite wall. Oh, shit! I heard Omar say, but I didn't hear anything else. I dropped the walkie and took off in a full sprint in the opposite direction. I didn't stop running until I hit the security office. Omar was smiling as I walked in. I told you! He said, pointing at the screen. This place is haunted as fuck! Whew. I watched the footage and saw what Omar had told me about. I was standing alone in the hallway, talking to no one. Uh, I felt sick to my stomach. I decided to take the rest of the shift off. I went home and stayed up for the rest of the night, afraid to sleep. When I felt better, I started looking into the hotel's past. Turns out the original owner of the Pullman was an eccentric named Wallace Uzziah. He made his money in the whiskey trade and liked to imbibe himself. The problem was he turned mean when he drank. When Prohibition hit, he poured his money into the hotel but never let his liquor connections go. Rumors were that he was mobbed up and the Pullman was used as a final destination for many men and women who ran afoul with gangsters or Wallace himself. One of his alleged victims was his mistress. I saw a photo of her. It was the woman I spoke to that night. When I take my walks around the Pullman now, I do it when Omar does his rounds. Not that two people would be able to do anything if a ghost appeared and got violent. But we Americans love the illusion of safety. Even though my rational brain has a hard time accepting there are ghosts in this world, I know what I went through. I saw, spoke, and interacted with a person who simply wasn't there. I think I need a raise. One. 243 miles above Earth. Ivan Babachev sat quietly staring through the portal, his blue eyes fixed on the distant planet he called home, Earth. His communication laptop sat blinking on the small desk next to his liquid lock drinking cup of what I imagined was his usual black tea. There was no odor to hint at this because it wasn't possible to drink from an open cup. 
I had learned what his favorite drink was through conversations and watching him prepare his morning provision. Ivan's gaze appeared empty from the vantage point where I sat. I sensed he held some serious thoughts within. Contemplations I surmised he was wrestling with. I understood why completely. The first six months aboard Project Worldview, PWV, which was a collective attempt to grow relationships with countries who struggled to find common ground and had been very difficult to overcome. Floating just over 200 miles above the world that we had all grown up in still seemed an impossibility. Yet, here we were. The world had become filled with troubles of overpopulation, political differences, and destruction through pollution. It seemed by recent weather catastrophes that maybe Mother Earth was revolting against us. Our different countries' quarrels had once seemed on the verge of being overcome, were now, of late, deteriorating once more. Like a yo-yo, up and down, or a pendulum swinging back and forth, each day's social temperature was now as predictable as a young teenage girl's mood. Up here, each of the three different countries' representatives' moods were not so tightly wound, it seemed. Major economic problems, along with battles over oil and other limited commodities, were now pulling the main powers back apart, choosing instead to isolate themselves in attempts to self-preserve. PWV had been a last-ditch effort that had more than likely been too tall in order and much too late a start to harness the achievements and goals that were hoped for. After all, we were only the third scientists-slash-astronaut teams arrived and settled to be sent so far. The United States, Russia, and the representatives of the Middle East. To each, one man along with one woman from each region with room for eight more. China was set to follow right behind the Middle East team, but then their troops began moving into Afghanistan, the oil fields once again being targeted. Now the six of us felt marooned from our homelands below. Efforts for either returning us or delivering new crews being sent were placed on hold. Tensions grew from the expected effects of close living quarters now as we were collectively wondering what would become of this floating shared retreat with our counterparts disagreeing in most all ideals. In the beginning, I had wondered how I myself would react to the change in atmosphere and how all the different forms of everyday living would affect me. Lack of gravity, restroom challenges, eating, even movement in general was a harsh deviation from what we were used to on Earth. Throw in the mix of people from other countries, countries that have stark differences in religion, politics, etiquette, you name it, it of course could very easily cause, well, a living hell, let alone the different sexes housed in such tight quarters, i.e. hormones and estrogen and testosterone. Ivan and I were able to become friendly, finally. It was a forced intention on both of our parts, I'm sure, but we now spoke openly and kidded around with each other without leading to fisticuffs. Violence of any kind was not tolerated on PWV. We were basically on display for the world to see as cameras ran 24-7. We were expected to show how we could and should get along to work out these global challenges we were all faced with back on Earth. Talks convening back home had not been going well. Up here looking down on them? Well, we were excelling right now. We all had been dreading China boarding the project, but we would see it through, when and if they should arrive. They were the latest aggressors, with intentions being very secretive, pulling out of world peace talks and breaking bilateral agreements. Soon, the UK, North Vietnam, Korea, and Canada were scheduled to arrive on board. Now, though, everything was on hold. We hadn't even received the latest rations delivery. We weren't in any dire straits yet, but we were all beginning to ration things more carefully. I sat close enough to Ivan, I noticed the flash of worry across his face. I suspected it came from the day's communique from his superiors, the one that the flashing light gave away on his laptop. His look of seriousness displayed within his eyes sparked a worry that seemed deeper than usual. His counterpart, Elizaveta Agapov, sat behind him and to his left. Her eyes bounced between Ivan and me. My female counterpart, Lexi Towers, had intimated that Elizaveta was interested in me and had been asking questions about my state of relationship. I had laughed it off for weeks, but when we literally bumped into each other at the entrance into the personal quarters corridor, PQC, 
I'd realized Lexi had indeed been correct. Two, spoken in Arabic. Tarek Badawi leaned into Fatima Farsi's ear and quietly spoke. This place is the white devil's nest, Fatima. He shook his head with disgust. We should return to Amman as soon as possible, before we are drawn in too deep within the den of sin. Allah is very displeased by all of this. Tarek, we must kill these demons and take their tongues as trophies before we return. Otherwise, would suggest our cowering defeat. World peace, bah! Tarek's dark eyes reflected his disdain for being sent here in the first place. Do we die here, or do we choose to die in our homeland? The end is on its set course as we speak. Tarek, we cannot sit and wait for such things to happen. We were chosen for a much more important reason than to just come here and watch from above like an albatross, like the carpet viper's venom. We must also kill from the inside out. Woman, do you truly stand here in my presence and presume to tell me what our purpose here is? You would be stoned for such arrogance if we were back home. Tarek's eyes narrowed as he lifted them upward. Allah, one true God of all, how shall I admonish Fatima for showing such contempt and scorn towards me? Oh, Tarek, are you not aware of the changing world we now live in? Up here in this community of sharing and love that we have entered? Fatima guffawed. All I would need to do is scream rape, and you would be crucified by any of the other infidels aboard. Put out of the base and into space. She grinned coyly. Tarek's eyes tightened and instantly became hotter than red glowing branding irons. You cannot live in two worlds at once, Fatima, enjoying Allah's way in one world and the devil's in the other. A woman's legs parted that distance opens her up for much deserved pain. And maybe the pain you imagine in your backward ways is actually pleasure in this new world we live in, amongst the lower creatures who live to gratify themselves with sins of carnal lust filled with sexual titillation, Fatima cackled. Your words of such heathenism are blasphemous against Allah Fatima, and he will punish you for speaking to them so easily. Tarek pushed Fatima against the wall as he pushed his palm against his door entrance scanner, causing the door to slide open. We shall see how you handle a serpent of sin. The door to Tarek's personal quarters quietly slid to a close after throwing Fatima through. 3. Communication from Earth I understand, Pavel. This is most unexpected. When will we cross into Ukraine? Yes, relations here have been adequate. How much time? Yes, I understand. We must claim final victory, Ivan. While my heart breaks for humanity, final dominion over our enemies is all we have left. This triumph of superiority has been laid upon your shoulders for our mother country. Yes, Pavel. Shall I inform Elizaveta of this vital knowledge? Can she be trusted to carry out this mission? Or will her emotions rule and interfere? Elizaveta is loyal. She will fulfill the necessary steps to complete a victorious end. Ivan... They must witness the destruction of their worlds. This is directly from the mouth of President Putin. He wants the dogs to see their world devastated before they die. Elizaveta, my god, that was incredible. I held no idea that sex 200 miles above Earth could be like this. I glanced back out through the portal, seeing the blue and green orb hovering in the dark vastness. What will your comrade think of this connection we have made together? My comrade has no ties or hold over me. Besides, she's the one that told me you were interested in me. Rob smiled and then continued to grin. I'm sorry, I can't erase this smile that is plastered across my face. What does this plastered mean? I don't understand what you say. Is this good thing, this plastered? It's a wonderful thing. 
It means I want to do this again. If I never make it back to Earth, I'll die a satisfied astronaut who rode a rocket 245 miles into space to make love to a beautiful Russian woman. There is nothing better than sex while we travel 17,000 miles an hour hovering above where home used to be. Yes, a smile plastered across my face is a good damn thing, Elizaveta. There, I must admit, our two worlds colliding together are explosive. Her eyes suddenly teared and her mood sank. Okay, Elizaveta, what did I just witness? I cannot say. She looked away to the portal as she nested into Rob's stomach. Ivan will be looking for me soon. You don't belong to Ivan, do you? Not in the way you are saying. Stay forever then, I said with a smile. Elizaveta tore her gaze away from the portal and turned to face me. Forever may not be as long as we think, Rob. Where did this come from? I asked. A tear squeezed from each eye and rolled into the air, hovering in between their faces. I was told to say nothing. She watched her tears as they hung weightless between them. But I don't think I can keep silent. 4. Eyes glued to the outside. Elizaveta could not keep her secret quiet from Rob. Ivan was furious with her. I trusted you, Elizaveta. You have betrayed not only me, but Mother Russia. What matter is it, Ivan? The world is going to be destroyed. Mother Russia is soon to be no more. This is what we are to have. This world and these other four will survive. She refused to lower her head in shame. The president wanted us to be the final ruler. How will this be possible now? What miracle can give him all this now? The door slid open and in came Lexi and Rob. Ivan, we need to talk, Rob spoke. Yes, yes, we do need to speak. Elizaveta glided around her colleague and approached Rob. This is almost unexpected. Ivan drew in a deep breath and held the rail as he turned to glance back out through the large portal to their world below. I have given orders, as I'm certain you now have heard. It seems it has come to the final hours. Vladimir wanted me to have you all watch the destruction and then put you down like dogs. But I now understand that Elizaveta has betrayed those wishes of our president. What good would that do for us? For you? Rob questioned. We will soon see if our countries are really so foolish with pride. The way I see it, this is a separate world divided from the one outside that portal. This world will also end without that world to supply us. Ivan's eyes sank deep into his brow. 11.5 billion souls are about to meet their annihilation, and here we are, hovering above, waiting to see it happen as if it were a theatrical release of sorts, each wondering what should happen next with the spectators who hold no control. Should I fight to be the last alive to prove my loyalty to an ex-KGB monster who is going to push the button that begins and end of the world as we know it? Ivan turned away, unconcerned if he were in danger from Rob. He stared at the colorful orb they were racing around at over 17,000 miles per hour, a complete rotation every 90 minutes. It's beautiful, isn't it? He looked back to Rob. Elizaveta pulled herself close to Rob, taking hold of his hand and squeezing it tightly. It seems we have been part of a great experiment which no one will know the results. Ivan laughed. Does the world down there even know what awaits them? He guffawed coldly. He looked into Elizaveta's eyes, then over to Lexi and back to Rob. I'm a scientist, a cosmonaut, not a murderer or a presidential puppet. There was a series of flashes that lit the inside of the space station. Ivan snapped his gaze back to the portal. Oh my god, he actually did it. Rob... Elizaveta and Lexi quickly maneuvered to portals where they could view what was happening. A series of brilliant explosions lit the surface of the earth from one side and then the other. The brilliant blue, white, tan, 
and green colors began blackening in growing circles of dark bleakness containing fiery oranges, reds, and yellows. All sounds in the room fell silent. Blinding white edges almost instantly appeared sporadically around the outer edge of the planet. The colors began to dull very quickly as the Earth's stratosphere quickly filled with tons of airborne soot. Within minutes, the Earth tone colors were swallowed by black with only subdued flashes of oranges as bright yellowish whites broke through the darkness, leaving a round shadow underneath the planet as it slowly disintegrated. Their world as they once knew it was gone, almost instantly devoid of all life, and the four stood speechless. Sounds of sighs and heavy breaths filled the darkening room they four shared. The quiet swish of the door opening that was usually almost unnoticed was suddenly a sound so loud it disturbed the quiet emptiness of the room and drew their eyes to turn. It was an act of sick reassurance of what we were seeing was not just a figment of each of our imaginations. Tarek and Fatima's complexions were both pale and gaunt, their yellow tannish skin appearing almost ghost-like the white rounds of their eyes like spotlights shining into the darkened room. Tarek was the first to speak out. Allah forgive us. We failed to slay the demons amongst us. Fatima maneuvered clear of Tarek as if to distance herself from his erratic words. Before the door slid quietly to a close, all lights within their sight began to flicker. Each instrument light, room light, and screen blinked on and off repeatedly until blackness replaced the flashes. Total darkness swept over them both inside the main room of the lab and outside the portal. They were engulfed by a shroud of cold, stark blackness, blacker than any darkest night one had ever seen on Earth. Nary a star shined. The Earth's flashes of fire and explosions swallowed up in an instant. Cold. 5. Silence Broken Hello? A single word sliced through the chilled emptiness. Soon sounds of shivers came from different places surrounding her. Is anyone still out there? She quietly asked, hoping for a response as she attempted to get her balance and bearings. Elizaveta spoke out. Ivan, are you still with me? When there was no response, she called out again to her new lover. Rob, are you here? Are you okay? A frigid chill rushed through her body. It felt deep within her bones, as if she had instantly been encased in a block of ice. She tried to speak out again, but the words became shards of frozen glass in her mouth. She felt her attempt to speak now slice through her tongue, laying it wide open before it became too solid to feel. Panic instantly overtook her mind as she gasped to take air into her lungs. Her throat stung from the cold that barely entered in through her nose and mouth. She had struggled, but all her mind would allow was a feeling of internal invasion. As much as she desired to fight the overwhelming and foreign feeling, she surrendered to it completely. Cold. Stillness. Dark. Elizaveta's eyelids pushed against the thickness of her surroundings and closed, covering what were her brilliant blue eyes. The color Rob had told her matched the beautiful sapphire blue waters of Earth lying hundreds of miles below them. His last whisper she had heard as he lay on top of her then heated moist body. Silence. 6. Aftershocks Elizaveta opened her eyes to the warmth of warm skin lying beside her. Nestled tightly under a blanket, her bottom legs and back felt almost steamy hot. There was a faint light coming from a round opening across the darkened space where she lay. Faint sounds of relaxed breaths escaping now echoed behind her. Her mind suddenly painted a picture of the face of a man from possibly the Middle East. Tarek? She silently questioned. She remembered a scenario of lovemaking last night, but it wasn't Tarek, was it? She slowly turned, attempting to move easy enough as to not wake the person beside her. The body next to her stirred as she shifted her weight and lifted herself up slightly so she could see the face. Her head suddenly felt as if it were in a clamp being squeezed tightly. Her temples throbbed. Fatima awoke in her cabin. She felt as if she had gone on a binge last night. She closed her eyes tightly for a few seconds, hoping to will away the pain behind her forehead and temples. She also struggled to remember just what she had done to bring on such discomfort. 
She suddenly smiled briefly. There was a shadow of a memory that she and Tarek succumbed to sexual weakness. No, she thought to herself. Tarek was far too traditional in his ways. He would never have... Fatima searched her darkened room to make sure she was indeed alone. She quickly felt satisfied she was and that she was possibly waking up from a dream. She glanced over to the digital clock screen on the communication module in the wall by the door. What? 1330? How have I slept in so late? Why has no one awakened me? She asked herself as one leg slid off the bed and onto the floor, the other quickly following. She immediately grabbed her head and applied pressure to both temples. The ache was intense. She laid back down, her feet still touching the floor. Rob quickly noticed that if he kept his head still, the pain would subside, and he would then be able to try and piece his thoughts together. At the sign of any slight movement, his head would return to pounding, his temples feeling as if they would explode. His portal to the outside appeared differently. The lighting was off. It seemed as if the top were the bottom and vice versa. He started to get up to investigate, but quickly fell back in excruciating pain. What the hell? He almost whispered because of the throbbing his speech caused. He closed his eyes and tried to recall his last hours before sleep. What was that humming? I don't remember ever hearing it before. He drew his little finger to his ear and plunged it inward. The sound felt as if it were internal, not external. The hum grew louder and it drove deeper into his pounding head. Rob drew both hands to his ears to cover them, but the movements it took to do so caused too much pain in the sides of his head. He dropped both hands and sighed. His thoughts began to shift before he succumbed to the need to close his eyes and lay completely still. 7. Ivan Ivan soaked in the black mist that surrounded his body. It warmed him and stimulated his soul. He was clueless what was happening to him, but he felt very comfortable with the outcome that seemed to be building within. It was power and it was invigorating. It swallowed the fear and devastation he had just experienced as he watched Earth explode and melt before his eyes. The choreography of the different huge explosions scattered across the sphere were as mesmerizing to witness as watching a famous painter work the oils across a canvas. It was, however, mixed with feelings of loss as he suddenly realized his family, friends, colleagues perished before his eyes amid the fantastic colors as they had mixed before the blackness began swallowing the crumbling world below him. He was now feeding from those emotions. It broke him down yet felt as if it were making him stronger, his hate for his enemies even more palatable. And to think I was befriending these dogs. Ivan took in a large breath of air and as it exited, he could feel his frosty breath leave his body and then mix with the atmosphere around him. How am I alive? He asked himself internally. He had seen the blackness from the explosions work its way upward until the swirling murky haze swallowed up the station he was inside. Just after they were engulfed, the power to their home in space began to fail, shutting down computers and life support systems. We should all be dead, frozen into blocks of ice. Are the others also alive? These questions now began to penetrate his brain and take over the thoughts from those previously occupying the space. Tarek, he is my only real threat, Ivan surmised. Fatima had shown signs of caving into the sexual clutches of Rob, putting her personal desires above her deity or country's desire. Lexi was no threat either with her small stature and penchant to cave to the strength of a man. And of course, Elizaveta was a loyalist to Mother Russia as he. Only Tarek was a danger, and he was indeed a threat. I must find him, and end this concern of apprehension. Ivan focused his thoughts on lifting his body from his prone position, the Emusk artificial gravity enabler still intact. The darkness he was surrounded in was disorienting, making it difficult to rise to any standing position. As his feet hit the surface below, he lifted himself upward and stood briefly before his head began to feel as if it were spinning. Ivan's arm reached outward grabbing instinctively to hold on to anything to stabilize himself. Finding nothing within reach, his eyes rolled up behind his eyelids and he freely fell backwards back onto the floor, missing the bed. 
His head made a loud thud upon contact, and blood exploded outward in a spray between his skin and suit as he lay sprawled on the floor. As the blood exploded from under Ivan's head, the darkness surrounded him and began to swirl and twist together, spinning faster and faster encircling him. There was a barely perceptible hissing screech that began growing in volume as the tornado of twisting atmosphere became wider and stronger. The walls of Project Worldview began to shake and shrink and swell in a rhythmic pattern. It was as if there was a life form of some sort that battled to maintain its control of existence. Outside the portals of the PWV, the blackness that had risen from the destruction of Earth began swirling in radical mirrored movements. A string of satellites made their pass in between the disintegrating Project Worldview station and the previous location of the Earth. The orbit pattern, which now held nothing in its place but large chunks of debris being pulled out into the outer atmosphere. An entire galaxy was now beginning to react to the greed and destruction of human society and its gluttonous pride and ignorance. A black hole forming and sucking their world into its abyss. The life form unknowingly hidden in the depths of the Earth's interior was instantly ejected into the outer cosmos by the nuclear devastation. As the underground caverns throughout the globe exploded outwards, a small nucleus of that form was able to take refuge inside the Project Worldview station and attempted to orchestrate invading and taking refuge in its inhabitants. The six human occupants' bodies were frozen in a cryogenic state, each in their own personal compartment. The mist surrounded the inhabitants one by one and absorbed into their shells, taking control of their non-responsive bodies. In the next hours of occupation, the six astronauts' minds were absorbed and overridden. One by one, lulled into dropping their guard so they could be overtaken, succumbing to the new life form's existence within. 8. The Menace from Below The alien was already somewhat acclimated to adverse temperatures being nestled deep within the depths of Earth's interior. The planet's core temperatures had begun warming from the global destruction the human's propensity to aggravate its climate with pollution, overpopulation, and greed. The entity hidden below the soil and rock's crust had long begun its migration deeper and deeper into the core. Like a cockroach scampering across a hot griddle, the alien withdrew deeper and deeper to avoid a rise in its temperature. It needed the sub-freezing temperatures to survive. While humans craved and found heat a necessity, the opposite was true for the underground life which hung on to the same planet's attributes. This destruction of the Earth was in fact a timely blessing in aiding the life form to migrate into a more fitting atmosphere of living. Stark ice cold. It was quite possible it would now survive and grow instead of shrinking and or dying. It did however need one thing that the human life forms had always provided. Brain waves. These biological synopses and unseen triggering of electrical impulses and charges that the human brain gave off had always been the source of nourishment that kept it procreating its form of life and existence. Its black mist, making its way to the surface for short times to feed unwittingly from the lower intelligent creatures called humans. Here lies the rub. These two life forms unfortunately needed one another to survive. The humans needed the black, misty creatures to keep their bodies from turning into frozen blocks of corpses on ice. The off-heating of the alien giving that form of survival improper intervals of a temporary thawing. The alien needed brainwave interaction to continue its existence. Where and how these forms of life would continue was the battle now at hand. This alien mist's priority was maintaining enough mental stimulation and temperature control to maintain the human's brainwave interactions for feeding. The dark mist continued to weave in and out between compartments, attempting to continue the six separate silent inhabitants' brain stimulations of thought and dreams. As it fed, it grew, becoming larger and filling the space of the station, warming its interior unintentionally. The quagmire within was a fight for survival the survival of each form. Each mind of the astronauts continued their dreams of life. Life before the dilemma they were now in existed. Happy moments that had given each of them the will to live. Moments of lovemaking for some. Moments of killing for one's country for others. 
held captive in their mental bliss, not knowing they were feeding the only thing that kept them alive. For the moment, struggle continued. One life form felt nothing of the turmoil it was indeed enduring, while the other fed from thoughts emitting within their internal mechanism, its growth slowly choking it from its quiddity. Survival of the dark mist appeared to be short-lived, which would in turn erase humanity from the galaxy. Total extinction for all involved. The death of life, and no one or nothing to witness its exit. 9. Part of a plan or happenstance. Moving at 25 kilometers per second was an asteroid. The tracking screen reflected the image in a form of a flashing green light slowly moving across a screen. It's the size of the asteroid created to impact Earth 66.4 million years ago, the impact that wiped out most all life on Earth upon impact. Operator 1 spoke. I suppose there is a plan with this one? Asked Operator 2. Things don't just evolve happenstance, you know that, retorted Operator 1. This appears to be close to the path of the disintegrating Project Worldview, stated Operator 2. As the asteroid raced within sight of the space station, there was an explosion of light. Particles from the station expelled outward among a dark cloud of mist appearing to collide into the reaching turbulence of the asteroid. It instantly became engulfed for a millisecond as the blackness of the cloud was sucked into the niches and canyons of the racing chunk of what was once a living, breathing planet in another galaxy. The event happened in a flash of the world's existence. In the aftermath of the asteroid's path, Six small frozen bodies could be seen hanging lifeless in the black void of space amongst pieces of metal and debris. They shine like tiny charms dangling from a bracelet, shimmering in the glow of the distant sun. They drew together in a flashing moment and slammed into each other in unison. An instant burst of slivers twinkled like a short-lived sparkler, dissipating quickly into the abyss of black. Human life destroyed forever in a spectacular scintillation of fading light. The green dot on the screen changed into a flashing red glow for an instant before again returning to a fading green glow moving across the monitor. The image on the video monitor of PWV, or Project Worldview, replayed the segment of the explosion and then the occupants' frozen bodies being obliterated into a blip of particles as the mist-covered asteroid disappeared into the distance. Operator 1 guffawed and then spoke in an almost whimsical voice. I guess the creator made his choice. It never pays to disrespect a planet you were given to inhabit and take care of. He chuckled. I guess we'll see how the next experiment sorts out. The black hole in the distance slowly pulled the debris into its path, slowly sucking, tumbling end over end as it disappeared from existence. A natural vacuum cleaner erasing any memory of mankind's existence and its failing disgrace into destruction. The pounding rhythmic drive of Queen's 80s hit echoed throughout Earth's previous home in the Creator's universe until dimming into silence. I suppose you are correct, replied Operator 2. Another one bites the dust. Once upon a time. A deep rumbling issued from Geppetto's stomach. A half a loaf of stale bread sat in his cupboard. It was to be saved for tomorrow. Meals, and as much as you could apply the term to a few slivers of bread, had become a once-a-day event. The life of a puppeteer was meager at times, especially when there was superior competition. The marionette theater of Dante Lasses, a young and talented puppet master, had left Geppetto's work seeming dull and old-fashioned. Dante's shows included innovative design, elaborate stages, and mechanical props. While Geppetto's creations showed a traditional aesthetic and skilled craftsmanship, Dante's puppets were wild, bizarre, and varied. Geppetto was true to the past. Dante was forging the future. The old puppeteer had tried to compete with his younger competition, of course. 
His workshop was filled with failed experiments, abominations carved from wood. While his rival's work may have been odd and stylized, Geppetto's own attempts to break away from tradition were frighteningly alien. Decapitated, pharaonic figures with tongues darting out from their gaping necks sat discarded beside blind sorcerers with mouths fixed in eternal screams of madness. Tiny wooden frogmen hung from their strings, the wind making them dance around a winged squid with jointed tentacles. These were more than failures. They were ugly, unchristian things. Geppetto found it disturbing that his mind had summoned such images. And what had inspired him to give those nightmares physical shape? Desperation and hunger, he supposed. This experimentation with his monstrous creations met poor reception. His new puppets were too grotesque for the public's taste. Too grotesque for his own taste as well. Now Geppetto placed his last hopes of saving his career in a most peculiar solution that promised to make his traditional marionettes far more intriguing than Dante's mechanized props or wild designs. In more bountiful times, he would have scoffed at such nonsense. Hunger and fear are the parentages of faith, though. Geppetto found his hope in the pages of an ancient text. If it worked, this would ground his show in the old rather than the new. Being an elderly man, he took comfort in old things. The text, a small booklet bound together with leather cord, was called the Libro de la Navi. He had been given the book by an old gypsy woman in his youth. The woman had been so impressed with his show that she had gifted the text to him, claiming it was a priceless study on puppetry. The volume, which had been morbidly amusing, depicting formulas and incantations for animating marionettes with a life of their own. The booklet's author claimed that the process described was a modification of the Jewish magic used to create golems. It also warned that such magic was not to be invoked under the wrong stars or some such astrological nonsense. In addition to the tools of his trade, chisels, files, saws, Geppetto had less mundane implements laid out on his workbench. Exotic herbs ground together with the beaks of octopus, dyes made from blood and marrow. The puppet he had chosen for this was his favorite, a little boy for which he had no name, though it was the oldest piece in his collection. In his shows, he would give it the name of a child in the crowd. Geppetto had carved a wooden boy 20 years prior, just before his career began to take off. In what had been a lonely life, the nameless puppet had many times seemed like a son to the puppet master. The process of animation required precision and painstaking detail. This was no problem. Geppetto was a master craftsman, with patience and an artist's eye. His hands might be wrinkled, but they were steady. After the symbols were etched, odd, curvaceous characters set within geometric anomalies, Geppetto placed a single drop of the blood and marrow mixture in the center of the symbol on the puppet's chest. To Geppetto's amazement and delight, the red mixture spread out through the etchings. Like a flowing river, it filled the curving lines of the chest glyph, and then the crimson gel bled out to the lines connecting with the other symbols. It was as if some unseen muscle was pumping the mixture along. Every line began to darkly glisten. Without consciously acting, Geppetto gave audible form to the incantation written within the pages of the Libro della Navi. The alien word slipped off the old man's tongue effortlessly. A red glow came from the blood-etched glyphs on the wooden body. The volume of Geppetto's voice grew and his timbre climbed higher. The unearthly glow within the symbols grew brighter in turn. Driven by some external volition, Geppetto sprinkled the powder bone and beak over the wooden boy. As the final words were invoked, the iridescence faded and the wooden boy's mahogany eyes shot open in a quick and violent manner. Behind them were windows to the star-smeared blackness of space. If the eyes truly are the gateway to the soul, then whatever spirit gave life to this puppet was as old and as dark as the void between worlds. With his heart in his throat, Geppetto commanded the puppet to rise. 
A moment later, it did just that. He foolishly believed this to be the proof of the creature's subjugation to him. This confusion was soon clarified. Screaming hate in a language older than the stars, the marionette's nose grew into a sharp point and it lunged for Geppetto's face. Though the words were foreign to the aged puppeteer, their meaning was clear. The puppet stabbed the tip of his nose into Geppetto's cornea with an uncanny celerity. The wound was not deep enough to kill, but it ruined the eye. Geppetto stumbled backwards and fell to the floor. The wooden demon was still perched on his chest. Its bloody nose was positioned just a fraction of an inch away from his remaining good eye. The puppet stopped for a moment and blinked. It looked as if it were thinking, trying to find the words it wanted. You don't command me, flesh thing. I command you. The meter of its words was uneven. Its voice was a pieced together mishmash of syllables stolen from the mouths of others. Oh God! Tears and snot streamed down the puppet master's face as he breathed the words. Speak not of God. The truth of God would make you weep and defecate, Mordo. The disjointed words of the animated nightmare swatted away Geppetto's prayer. God would grind your soul to dust, but be not you has use for you. That night, while the stars were right, Geppetto brought unwholesome life into all his most hated creations. Pinocchio had insisted. By dawn, it was more than just a wooden boy who moved with the will of terrible otherworldly things. The tongue-headed pharaoh licked at the remnants of blood and marrow on the workbench. Knee-high sorcerers formed a circle, screaming ugly mantras in a clumsy language. Tiny frogmen tortured insects and presented them to the click and hinge tentacles of a somnambulant cedar monster. Pinocchio sat on Geppetto's shoulder, looking out at the pantheon of dark gods. His wooden hand stroked the puppeteer's hair. Geppetto had seen too many impossible things that night and he had touched the soul of madness and hate itself. Insanity loomed, beckoning him into its embrace, but Pinocchio would not allow the puppeteer such release just yet. What now? Geppetto asked, knowing that his ordeal was far from over. In fact, he feared it would never end. Now, flesh thing, we put on a show. Dante Lasses was an egoistic young man. He was the kind of person who, with a mixture of luck and natural talent, had met with success early on in life. Success had come to Dante a bit too easily, though, to the detriment of his character. For the last few years, he had been Italy's most notable puppeteer. His innovative shows had been performed for wealthy merchants, royalty, and even high-ranking clergy. He was, indisputably, the only performer in his field that mattered. Why, then, was he hearing so much chatter about Geppetto's stringless wonders? What could that washed-up has-been be doing to garner so much attention? Fate, rather than luck, provided an opportunity for Dante to see the wonders of Pinocchio in the Black Pantheon. As Dante was packing up his own show, he was approached by a young woman with a lunatic gaze. Her bulbous eyes looked like they wanted to escape her face. She extended her arm toward Dante, offering him a handwritten flyer. Do come see the show, she said with an uneven voice. The flyer boasted of a wooden boy with eyes like a midnight sky in August. Scrawling letters promised the Black Pantheon who calls fire from the sky and several other outlandish claims. 
All things could look impressive with proper calligraphy, thought Dante. He was skeptical that Geppetto could fulfill such promises. Even if the old man had crafted some innovative manner of marionette, his storytelling was juvenile and stale. To Dante's surprise, the commons which hosted Geppetto's show were teeming with spectators. Though many were natives of Florence, it was clear that a large minority had hailed from across Italy. Dante recognized several men in the crowd who had no reason to be in the city. Merchants from Milan, a prostitute he knew from Venice. Even Cardinal Benedici was in attendance, accompanied by several nuns. The people he recognized, as well as those grouped amongst him, had a look of manic delight on their faces. They all stood at the back of the audience, trembling with anticipation. Some of the Florentine locals were commenting on how these excited folks in the back had been following the Black Pantheon across Italy. After the first performance of this new show, so Dante heard from the gossiping crowd, a dozen people left their homes to follow Geppetto and glean each performance. This was happening, at least according to the rumors, at each locale where the Black Pantheon had been performed. There were darker rumors murmured on the lips of the Florentines as well. Stories bounced back and forth of how a month after the Black Pantheon had left Venice, a third of the city drowned themselves, dragging down anyone within reach beneath the canals. Wilder still were the tales that days after the mass suicide, the canals were teeming with demonic mermen. Whispers danced through the crowd, tales that balls of lightning had rolled through Milan, burning and shattering anything and anyone who had not followed Geppetto out. Padua was supposedly steeped in anarchy and civil unrest. Bologna, according to one young man, had been left as a ghost town with no sign of what caused the city's inhabitants to flee. Perhaps the wildest report was that Pisa had crumbled into the Tyrrhenian Sea. It was all nonsense as far as Dante was concerned. Old Geppetto had come up with a clever ploy to draw in crowds. A grim little puppet show that leaves death and darkness in its wake. People are a curious and sadistic lot. What truly intrigued Dante was the size of the stage. Dante himself worked with a large set. But this was an enormous wooden structure, scaled for a full-on work of drama. What could the Black Pantheon possibly offer to warrant such a space? Two curtains ran across the front of the stage. A large black sheet of velvet hung from ten foot above the stage down to the floor. The second curtain was a burgundy color which spanned a four-foot space above the black. This higher curtain was the first to rise. The crowd hushed as a little wooden boy was revealed, sitting high up on a plank of wood above the lower curtain. His eyes were as black as night with specks of cosmic light. In those eyes, each spectator could see every secret shame and pain of their souls reflected back at them. Some began to weep. Others averted their gaze. Pinocchio surveyed the crowd. Taking his time, the wooden boy made eye contact with all who looked upon him. A primal and inexplicable fear encroached upon Dante's soul as the marionette locked eyes with him. A voice drifted out of Pinocchio's cellulose body. It was the small sound of a young boy, but held within was the rage and pain of Apollyon, Prometheus, and Loki. Though his words said, Welcome all to the Black Pantheon, his tone communicated something else. It said, I have returned, and I am your end. Pleasantly cheerful music from some unseen calliope began to play as the lower curtain parted, revealing Geppetto, who was standing with two marionettes. One was the decapitated black pharaoh with its flickering tongue, with his other hand, he held the controls for an Arab sorcerer with insane rage permanently carved into its face. Geppetto stood silently sobbing as the two marionettes bowed at the front of the stage. The old puppeteer was haggard and emaciated. His eyes were sunken into his skull and one had lost all color. His hair looked thinner than Dante had remembered, 
as did his body. The most disturbing thing about Geppetto's appearance was the presence of stitches running from the inside of his elbows to the base of his wrists. The skin around the sutures was puffy and raised red with infection. Milky fluid oozed down his arms. Health is oftentimes the cost of success, Dante thought. This notion was a desperate mental guard against the darker, more disturbing inclinations going through the young puppeteer's mind. The puppets were abhorrent, yes, but no reason to submit oneself to ludicrous and superstitious thinking. Pinocchio's mouth opened, and the wells of hell blew out. The sound was not perceived by the ears, rather it vibrated through the soul. Following the infernal resonance, Pinocchio struggled to find words in the limited language of man that would properly express his anger and intent. It was like an exterminator screaming at insects as to why he was killing them. Man is a vain beast with delusions of Godhead. He views creation through a warped lens also that he may place his world at the center of all things. The wooden pharaoh's tongue flicked out like a stiletto, cutting the strings which held it up. With no support from the puppet master, the wooden king stood proud and moved of its own accord. The tiny hands of the screaming sorcerer lit bright with flame, burning away its tethers. Even as the two puppets leaped off the ground and began clambering up Geppetto's arms, Dante's mind was wildly grasping for logic and reason. The fire could be explained by a device of flint and alcohol preps. The puppet semen animation could be the work of thin strings and an unseen assistant. What happened next, though, Dante could find no method to explain away. Puppets thinking they pulled the strings is what you are. But we will show you the world as it is. While Pinocchio spoke, the carved monsters which had clambered up Geppetto's arms now began to unstitch him, from the elbow down to the wrist. Once his flesh had been opened, revealing soft tissue, muscle, and bone, the pharaoh and the Arab ripped a large artery from each of his arms, letting them dangle at the wrist. Some of the crowd stood transfixed, enthralled by the violence on stage. Others cried and trembled. Others still attempted to run away, only to be met by the Black Pantheon's followers waiting at the back of the crowd. Any who tried to leave, be they man, woman, or child, were met with the fists, boots, teeth, and nails of Pinocchio's faithful. Dante looked around as an orgy of madness developed. The gathered spectators were beginning to cry and laugh. Men were grabbing the closest people to them, regardless of sex or age, and forcing themselves upon them. An old woman only a few feet from Dante began to pleasure herself with one hand while clawing deep gouges into her own face with the other. On stage, Geppetto's arteries ascended skyward, causing the old man's arms to jerk upwards. The bloody organic string skithered straight into the hands of Pinocchio above. Dante felt insanity overwhelming him and tried to fight it off with logic. Looking toward the stage, watching the old man paraded about like a marionette, he could read Geppetto's lips. Kill me. Dante wished he could oblige Geppetto. Instead, he decided to flee. Before he could turn and run, strong hands grabbed his arm and forced it behind his back. A moment later his face was smashed into the ground as he found himself prone with his ass up in the air. Behind him, some massive man was laughing and grunting. Dante struggled to regain control of his arm, fearing what depraved act his attacker had in mind. It was no use. His beastly assailant was immensely strong. Dante reached back, hoping to retrieve a carving knife which he kept tucked in his boot. The attacker torqued his arm further, snapping it. The young puppeteer, unaccustomed to pain, let out a high-pitched squeal. 
The fire in his nerves overcame him, and the thought of the makeshift weapon escaped his mind. Drinking in Dante's pain, his attacker continued his assault with fervor. Several times, the behemoth smashed Dante's face into the packed earth. The impact left his world spinning. Before he could take stock of what had happened, he was hoisted above the crowd. His dangling broken arm and bloody face incited the spectators to claw and tear at him. Ungodly pain overcame Dante as a half dozen Florentines screamed out blasphemies and ripped the flesh from his bones. Dante Lacesse's final glimpse of the world was the image of Geppetto, arms flayed with the end of the cosmos playing out on the stage around him. The older puppeteer was staring sadly toward him with tears streaming down his cheeks. The last sound was the exultant chanting of unpronounceable names, accompanied by the cheerful tune of a calliope. From the darkness of his crate where Pinocchio kept him between performances, Geppetto wept. He had learned to become virtually silent in his sorrow. The demonic things which possessed his puppets took immense delight in his suffering, and he would not willingly feed their depraved appetites. He imagined that even in his silence they could somehow taste his pain, seeping through the pores of his glyph-etched wooden prison. Pain was the reason Geppetto was allowed, or perhaps forced, to keep his sanity. Nature would have delivered any man to the merciful arms of madness if they had seen a fraction of the horrors which he had witnessed. The Black Pantheon willed that the puppeteer be restrained within the confines of lucidity. His suffering was married to his sanity, and his suffering was a key part of the show. He was a symbol to mankind that resistance met only with despair. Despair was worsened by hope. Geppetto still hoped, albeit faintly, that Pinocchio could be stopped. It was this tiny spark in the darkness which had inspired the wild gambit that he was now waiting for to pan out. Geppetto, having something of a reputation, was allowed to solicit spectators in new cities. He was chaperoned, of course, by one of Pinocchio's faithful. The zealots who followed the Black Pantheon were detached madmen. Their disassociation from the mindset of baseline humanity left the enslaved showmen some room for acts of undetected subversion. In Florence, Geppetto had suggested to a former priest who now found God in the void of Pinocchio's eyes that they solicit businessmen in the poorest district of the city his explanation was that the destitute and desperate are in the most need of entertainment and also most easily swayed. To the priest, this made perfect sense. He followed Geppetto into a tavern that looked as if it catered to a rougher element of humanity, insisting that he understood the poor far more intimately than a member of the clergy could. Geppetto suggested that his lead should be followed. The priest was not to speak under any conditions. The two sat at the bar. Geppetto had ordered a glass of wine for each of them, the cheapest they had. To his right sat a rugged-looking man bearing more scars than the life of an honest city dweller should warrant. The poor condition of his clothes contrasted with the fine quality of the booze he was drinking. This helped to show that his priorities were also out of line with those of a hard-working but underprivileged citizen. Uh, drinking the good stuff, eh? You must have a kind of bossa than we do. The rugged, scarred man simply grunted in a dismissive but non-threatening way. Ah, the bastard is rolling in gold, Geppetto continued, talking into his glass like a disgruntled drunk. And here we are, the talent and the manpower, stuck drinking a swill. The rugged man took the bait and turned toward Geppetto. That's a real shame, Fred. Who is it you work for? Geppetto downed the cheap wine before catching his new bar friend's gaze. Some fat Spanish bastard named Vega. I'm a puppeteer in his travel in the show. I'm the talent. 
But he fronted the startup money. You know how it is. I'm working for Swill Wine while he gets rich. The rugged man slapped Geppetto on the back in a friendly manner. Uh, that's a real shame, friend. Where the world, though? Producing two coins from his purse, the scar-faced man ordered a glass of the finest wine for Geppetto and the priest. These rounds are on the me, boys. So, tell me, how long is the show in town? Bringing the discussion back to the show eased the priest. He was beginning to feel that Geppetto's lies were being used as allegory so that he may complain about their master with impunity. Now he believed that Geppetto was manipulating this poor wretched beast into seeing the show. And we leave with the day after next. Then we head south out of the city for four days of miserable travel. And that is how Geppetto set the stage for his insurrection against the gods of darkness. He handed this criminal the time and place where the caravan would be. Surely dreams of the gold he spoke of would inspire the bandit to attack the caravan and make off with the promised loot. Of course, there was no gold, as the Black Pantheon had no need of it. The chaos of an ambush on the caravan might just distract his captors long enough for him to escape. Despair and hope danced in Geppetto's head as he waited for the attack, which might never come. From the confines of his crate, time was almost non-existent. He could have been waiting for minutes, or perhaps he was already approaching the next town which his creations would use as a further stepping stone toward human extinction. Then came the sounds of salvation, the thunk of arrows into wooden carts, the panic neighing of horses, this was Geppetto's chance. The waning moon hid behind a veil of clouds, diffusing what little light there was into a glowing haze. The dim light from the will-o'-the-wisp sky was obscured further by the thick canopy of overhead leaves which made this portion of road seem more like a tunnel. Antonio could not have asked for better conditions. Just as the drunken puppeteer had told him, the caravan of the Black Pantheon clunked and clattered down the road. It was odd that they traveled at night and with no lamps or torches. The puppeteer had explained that his boss was a greedy bastard, not prone to waste time on frivolities such as making camp for the night. In that light, Antonio reasoned the lack of light made sense. With all that gold, they wouldn't want to call attention from bandits. Still, there was something unsettling about the dark procession of carriages. Having waited for the majority of the carts to hit a wide turn in the road, one that would make it hard to run forward or retreat, Antonio whistled. On his signal, arrows began to rain upon the caravan. The horses were the first targets, meeting painful ends as razor-tipped shafts tore through their muscled flesh. As the beasts fell or panicked, the carts came to a quick halt, some of them tipping onto their sides. The scene was a mess of shattered wood, spurting blood, and the frantic screams of animals in pain. Antonio watched eight of his men drop their bows and rush toward the carts. Descending upon the caravan, each man produced a weapon more conducive to close-up fighting, stilettos and clubs mostly. Antonio himself stayed in the wood line, with two other archers. If there happened to be a real fighter amongst the showmen, it would be better for someone else to discover it. That kind of thinking had served him well in a long life of crime. No sooner had the bandits began breaking open the doors of the carts and carriages than the zealous servants of the Black Pantheon poured out of the vehicles with mad rage. Antonio's men began the melee strong, smashing the skulls or introducing organs to the cold kiss of steel. Less than a minute passed before the tide had changed. In their previous experience, ambushes on artisans were met with panic and submission, but the servants of Pinocchio knew no fear. The faithful fought back with no concern for themselves. The bandits were overwhelmed by both sheer numbers and raw ferocity. The members of the caravan lunged at their armed aggressors with nothing but fists and teeth. 
Antonio watched from the trees, astounded as this mass of human monsters ripped his men to bits. Neither knife nor club had any effect unless the blow delivered an instant kill. Pain was not a factor for them. The remaining archers loosed arrows into the mob of lunatics who tore, beat, and ate their partners in crime. Antonio, gripped by a deep and primal fear, took several steps back. Fear, in Antonio's opinion, was a powerful survival tool, but like all tools, it had to be controlled and mastered. This payday could still be salvaged if he kept a cool head. Embracing the darkness like a protective cloak, he hoped the mob would see only the other two men. It seemed that this was indeed the case as several blood-drenched psychotics turned their gaze toward the woodline. He quickly flanked around the corner of the bend, hoping the horror show on the road would cover up the noise of his steps. His eyes bounced back and forth between the madmen storming toward his archers and an ornate cart with barred windows. Antonio waited a few seconds, looking for any sign of life in what he was sure was the bank carriage. There could be a guard or two in there, covering the gold under any and all circumstances. Better to fight a few professionals than the swarming mass of crazies just around the bend. With that thought in mind, Antonio made a hasty break for the carriage that he believed was his last chance at the money. Powered by adrenaline and fear, the scar-faced bandit raced across the road. In one single motion, he burst through the door of the carriage. Antonio was amazed to find no guards at all. All that sat in the cart was a single locked chest, ornately carved with symbols of odd design. Less interested in the craftsmanship of the chest than in its contents, Antonio pulled a club out from his belt and in three strikes managed to smash the lock from its hasp. He had hoped to take all the gold. That was a bit unreasonable under the current circumstances. On the bright side, there would be no one left to divvy up his loot with and no one he would have to double cross. That being taken into consideration, Antonio felt that simply filling his satchel from the chest should be a more than adequate prize. As the wicked man bent down to open the chest, he was beaten to the punch. As if possessed with a life of its own, the lid flew open, catching Antonio on the chin. He stumbled back, bleeding and confused. He stood dumbstruck, holding his jaw as the old puppeteer from the bar leapt out of the chest and drove a carving knife deep into his stomach. Lying on the floor, bleeding and unable to crawl away, Antonio listened to the fleeing steps of the old man. Strangely, instead of pondering death or God or even his own pain, Antonio simply wanted to know why the man was locked in a box. The implications terrified him, though he couldn't begin to guess the truth. Drifting in and out of consciousness several times, Antonio awoke to what he was sure was a pre-death hallucination. Standing on his chest was a child carved from wood with eyes like the sky at night. His face was a rosy cheek smile, which somehow projected every vile thought in existence. The wooden boy spoke and Antonio's arteries tore through the flesh of his arms, just as the layers of his mind were peeled back and etched with the burning sorrow of cosmic truth. Geppetto walked through the streets of Florence, unafraid of what the public might infer from his blood-drenched clothes or the festering stitches on his arms. There was no public left, or at least very little. Those not already left as awful in the streets were gibbering in corners or delighting in the most extreme masochisms. When one of the crazed denizens of this glorious city-turned-necropolis did notice him, they were overwhelmed by awe. Geppetto was, after all, Pinocchio's chosen one. He could have run ahead to the next town on the Black Pantheon's parade of destruction. He could have warned them. But even if they paid mind to the mad ravens of a sickly vagrant, what good would it do? No sword or arrow would stop Pinocchio or the Black Pantheon. 
Instead, Geppetto sought out a weapon of true power which may cast out the horrors he had brought upon the world. The Libro delle Navi was supposedly based on the Kabbalistic magics of the Jews. So it was to the ghetto of Florence that Geppetto sought out the knowledge which would be his weapon of insurrection. The ghetto had not been spared, and like the rest of Florence, the streets were filled with ash, entrails, and occasional madmen. To his relief, the synagogue still stood, with only minor defacement to the exterior. The heavy wooden doors bore smears the color of rust. Thoughts of lamb blood painted doors flashed through his mind, though it was a safe bet that this was not the blood of any lamb. Weak from exhaustion, infection, and atrophy, Geppetto was barely able to push open the doors. Once inside, he was met with shock. Standing in the center of the temple, eyes set skyward stood a rabbi. His clothes were not ripped nor covered in gore. His body bore no scratches, bruises, or lacerations. His back was to the puppeteer, though, and Geppetto was sure that what would turn around would be monstrous. He was wrong. The man that turned toward him was old but able-bodied and wore a look of humility and sincerity. The rabbi regarded Geppetto with a sad smile. His face held no sign of fear or malice. Extending both hands outward, he spoke. Welcome, Geppetto. The Lord told me you would come. It took longer for Geppetto and Rabbi Blennis to catch up to the Black Pantheon than they would have liked. Geppetto's infections were worsening, and without the unholy magics of Pinocchio keeping him stable, death was surely around the corner. His illness made for slow travel. Eventually, after passing through two ravaged villages, the two caught up to the Doomsday Parade. No matter how noble, it would be absurd for two men to attack the Black Pantheon alone. Geppetto and Blanis had not come alone, though. Using puppets left over from Dante Lasses in Florence, the puppeteer and the rabbi created new golems. One was an anthropomorphic fox with a cane, the other a blindfolded cat of similar nature. Both had been animated by methods akin to those taught in the Libro delle Navi. Blanis had explained that these puppets would be possessed by angels. The Black Pantheon was about to begin their show in the marketplace of Siena. Geppetto and Blanis stood disguised amongst the spectators. The old puppet master feared Pinocchio or one of his ilk would sense him. Blanis assured him that they were cloaked by faith. As the lunatic followers of Pinocchio passed him in the marketplace without a second glance, Geppetto began to feel more confident. Perhaps the dark gods inhabiting his puppets were not all-powerful. With a newfound, if shaky, faith in cosmic justice, Geppetto waited for the curtain to lift. It was imperative to wait for the show to begin. God had told Blanus that the masses must see the Lord's wrath firsthand. The first curtain was already up, and Pinocchio surveyed the crowd to the upbeat tune of the Calliope. Tonight's show shall be different, the puppet said in a voice that echoed Hell's thunder. The second curtain ascended skyward. On stage, in Geppetto's usual place of honor, the scar-faced thief named Antonio staggered back and forth. A terrible punishment had befallen him for causing the loss of the Black Pantheon's favorite performer. A twinge of guilt came over Geppetto for not having cut the man's throat. Tonight, you will witness firsthand the battle for your world. The daydream of God will be ground to dust by the real thing. The starry discs that were the Dark God's eyes set straight upon Geppetto as he spoke. He could feel the evil thing's gaze on his soul. Pinocchio knew he was there. Your move, father! The mocking tone was filled with such hate that Geppetto almost stood down. But this was not only his last chance, it was also the world's last chance. 
assuring himself that there could be no more noble way to meet oblivion, Geppetto took a step forward. Blanis patted Geppetto's back assuredly as the two men walked through the gathered mass. Beside the rabbi and the puppeteer, walking on their own volition, were the lame fox and blind cat. The men and women of Siena cleared a path and watched in confused awe as the forces of good strode toward the heart of chaos. This was the moment of truth and judgment. It would not come again. With each step, Geppetto felt more righteous and confident. His strength was returning as he walked with angels into battle. And then, as he truly believed for the first time that the God of Light would come through, he felt his knee snap. Pain overwhelmed him as he hit the ground. Geppetto wasn't sure what had happened until he saw the fox's cane swinging toward his face. Somewhere behind the sound of his own heartbeat, Geppetto could hear Blanis laughing. The blind cat assaulted Geppetto's face, its dull wooden claws leaving splinters in his flesh. The fox continued pummeling the old man with its cane. Blanis stood above him, cackling and spitting. Geppetto couldn't help but notice how much he resembled the mad Arab sorcerers which had come to life and turned against him. <laughs> the Lord did tell me you would come, Geppetto. <laughs> and he commanded I return to him what is his. <laughs> Geppetto wept on the ground as the last fragments of hope dissolved from his heart. He now knew beyond all doubt that Blanis spoke the truth. There was no hope. The end would not be wrought by the final judgment of a heavenly patriarch. The end was here, and it was the black anger of a malevolent universe. Pinocchio stretched out his arms as madness overtook the crowd. His wooden mouth contorted as he spoke the words that Geppetto already knew. We are the angels, father. The truth of God is that he acts through we. <laughs> Part 1 Warren Biggs thundered into the radio station that sat at the edge of town. The town itself sat at the edge of an expanse of cornfields mingled with six acres of woodland. This was not his day. He arrived with his hands full, as usual, and cool weather had made the studio door lock uncooperative. First, it wouldn't take his key. Then it took it, but wouldn't let it go. He had made it inside with only seconds to spare, fumbling his donuts against his paunch where the souls of many devoured donuts already languished. He caught his foot on the leg of a rolling chair that had been left out in the walkway four inches too many. Laws of physics determined that this would result in some spillage from his coffee. But just a few drops. He sat down in front of the control board with a seismic thunk. Grabbing his headset caused the wire attached to it to pull his coffee into his lap, where it spilled much more than a few drops, in a place where there were much more than a few nerve endings. It was a howl that rattled the glass, but it was too early for anyone to be around to hear. He switched on the obsolete equipment and gave it the obligatory waiting period that it needed to warm up. He shook his head, hoping that his boss wasn't doing a station performance audit. His boss was not, so Warren's morning DJ show hit the airwaves at 5.15am instead of the official 5am, an anomaly that wasn't terribly uncommon. With tears in his eyes from the spill of lava hot java on his oh mama, he hit the ground in form when the on-air light went green. Good morning from the sticks of Stocksville. Poor Joe and rock and roll all you lovely dreamers and doers riding that early worm into the sunrise. DJ Warren Peace is going to keep you warm on this chilly September day with the hottest tunes from the coolest artists. So, stoke your fire and go get over that hump of today's hump day. Go get what's yours. Start a fire. 
Start a fire! Start a fire! Well, that was the part he lived for. By the third start a fire, he was swinging one chubby arm in the air like he had a lasso. And then, that cued the stretch where his failed career as a motivational speaker was replaced by music that got played through his thin speakers in the back rooms of diners and employee lounges and motel lobbies and gas station bathrooms. Songs that were veritable EVPs of people that had bought into the American dream, gotten it, and likely lost it by the time anyone could attach their names to their songs. And now the ghosts of their success were rained down on a quiet town full of people that were too busy to think about the American dream. All except for the teenagers. Teenagers are composed of nothing but dreams. For a teenager to give up on their dreams would be a tantamount to self-mutilation. Teenagers like Jacob Pines, a lad who was 16 and every bit the pretty boy that girls swooned over along with their moms. Oh, did Jacob ever have dreams? Most of them centered around getting the attention of the equally gorgeous Jane Corcoran. But, like anyone else that bought into dreams, they didn't think much on the discrepancy between the volume of his efforts versus the results. He could have been one of the faces that music producers take under their wing and manufacture into pop stars with zero talent. Jake didn't know how to leverage his pretty boyness. He tried getting Jane's attention by staring at her longingly, the way some boys can manage when they're models in front of a camera. He just ended up looking like a creepy kindergartner, sizing up a box of animal crackers. Not that it mattered. She did not notice. They tried showing off for her in gym class. He was a capable athlete. He'd make the shots, the touchdowns, the winning points. But she never seemed to be paying attention during those critical moments. She always had that dreamy, faraway look to her, like she were in a perpetual state of being mentally absent, some place where Jake's peacock feathers couldn't be seen. People willing to listen to Jake moan about his girl problems were a rarity in his world. You're not supposed to be prone to such things when you're hot. In spite of this, Ryan Lambert, with his bowl cut and poster-worthy dark eyes, was able to reach into the depths of his utter lack of experience with girls and offer some good advice. Dunno, man. Maybe you'll have to start with something she actually likes. Like, um, you know, get into what she's into? Yeah, well, what's she into? Ryan shrugged hard enough to pull his head into his Jersey turtle fashion. Well, I don't know nothing about her. And nobody did, really. Jake discovered this with his attempts at overhearing anything Jane might say about herself. The only time she ever talked was to answer the teacher's questions to the class. Desperation drove Jake to his boldest move yet. The P.E. teacher's shrill whistle pealed throughout the gym, signaling everyone to come out of the locker rooms, one pool of boys and one pool of girls, both groups in the gray shirts and blue shorts that marked them as being the property of Stocksville Middle School. One of those groups was missing a member, Jacob Pines, who had hung back in the boys' locker room. He slipped into the girls' locker room when everyone was doing laps outside. He knew what her binder looked like. Pink flowers against a darker pink background. He went through the lockers whose combo locks had been carelessly left open, hanging like hooks. He prayed that one of them was hers. One of them was. There were clothes and her binder. He was so proud of himself. There had to be something about her. Anything, really inside that binder. The binder was closed with a tiny lock, the kind that wouldn't stand a chance against a screwdriver, but that was more than a match for Jake's paws. He wasn't proud anymore. He resigned himself to the fact that Jane Corcoran was a safe he would never be able to crack. He put everything back in their places, and he even managed to slip into the line of red-faced teens doing laps in the schoolyard. Gym class ended and he changed his clothes and he sat with a vacant stare. He was gazing down the long tunnel of time at his future life, where Jane couldn't be seen. The bell rang. Jake was the last to file out. He turned the corner of the doorway and smacked right into Jane Corcoran, knocking her binder out of her hands and causing it to break its lock on the floor, sending the binder's contents scattering. Jake became a little more religious in that moment. Um, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, he lied. Her crystal blue eyes flashed at him before she shook her head. No, no, you're fine. 
she said as she started scooping up the sheer volume of papers that should not have been able to physically fit inside the dimensions of that binder. He didn't ask for permission to help her. He began shoveling papers, and he found that mingled with her schoolwork were all manners of sketches and handwritten notes on monsters. Cryptids, Bigfoot, Mothman, the Jersey Devil, Black-Eyed Children, and so on. But the bulk of the heap seemed to be devoted to the local monster. Some called it Peg Leg Peggy. Others called it Sally Stilts. Stick Woman. It almost looked as if there were more drawings of Peg Leg Peggy than there were sheets of schoolwork. Jackpot, said Jake's brain before the mound of papers he was holding were snatched away from him. Oh man, she was dead hot when she was mad. Her straight blonde hair seemed to flare out like the fur of an irritated cat. Thanks, she said, effectively dismissing Jake from helping her salvage her valuables. Are you sure? I don't mind help. I said thanks. He left her without a word and wearing his dumbest grin yet. Part 2 Jacob was disappointed to find that there just wasn't much information about Peg Leg Peggy on the internet. He could count on one hand how many pages there were in a Google search that contained scanned information, and none of them had any real artwork or pictures to speak of. He was wanting to draw Jane a picture of her favorite monster, but it looked like he was going to have to go off of a simple crayon drawing that was uploaded by one author's child, and whatever he could remember from the papers he saw in her binder. He guessed that most of those had been drawn by her. A true fangirl. So, he did the best that he could, going off of the vague descriptions of creatures that he found on the internet. An otherwise featureless human female torso, gaunt and emaciated from living a life in the wild, and with whatever limitations are brought on by having sticks for arms and legs, perhaps it killed things by impaling them. It had a mouth that seemed to go from the bottom of one ear to the other, creating a long slit that allowed for it to open up extremely wide almost like the way the jaw of a snake unhinges. They gave it various injuries as you would associate with living in the wild with no medical treatment. The final product didn't look much better than the original children's drawing that guided him. He too was using crayons, but he was pouring every romantic fiber he had into this picture, as if it were the one prize rose that would woo his beloved, if a rose could ever do such a thing. It was finished. It was his most serious work of art since he was six. It was beautiful, and she was going to love it. She would be so taken by his attention to detail and his realism with Crayola that she was bound to throw her arms around him and kiss him and confess her eternal love. She was not at school the next day, or the day after. He boldly went to her house to deliver the picture in person, he didn't know why he was so certain that she would be the one to answer the door. The door was answered instead by her mother, a beakish woman with eyes that were always wide, and a cross around her neck large enough to nail Jacob to. Can I help you? She asked, in a tone that said she didn't want to help anyone. Hey, um... Miss Jacob, I'm just checking on Jane. She hasn't been at school. She smiled. Yes, yes, yes. The poor dear has been under the weather. Now, how are you involved with my daughter? Well, we're classmates. Yes, 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 but how are you two involved? Jacob felt very uncomfortable. I mean, we just talk about monsters and stuff. Um, see, I drew her a picture of her favorite monster for a, a project, and I was just hoping... The woman snatched for the drawing like a chicken goes for a fat grasshopper. She held the drawing aloft, crushed in her grasp. Jane Mallory Corcoran, you're still taking communion with demons? Demons! The woman began speaking in tongues while citing scripture in English. She spun around like a dementia patient convinced that they were the Warner Brothers Tasmanian Devil. She saved the tail end of her babble for Jacob. Messenger from hell. Slam. A creeping dread settled into Jacob's stomach. He had just started a fire, and this woman seemed every bit the type to deal with fires by flogging them, 
was stretching them on a rack and demanding a confession. He began walking home, feeling awful. How would he redeem himself from this one? He was walking past some garbage set out for collection when he noticed something pale and pink. The resident had set out a department store mannequin. It was just a head and a torso. He knew exactly what he was going to do. It was a shot in the dark, but white-hot teenage love takes those kinds of crapshoots. It took a lot of duct tape and balancing, but there stood Peg like Peggy on four sticks, her hair a mess but her body poised to strike whoever dared to enter her woodland. The mannequin was just the right size and shape, and there was no shortage of tree branches littering the forest floor to make her arms and legs. An old mop supplied the monster's hair. Instead of offering Jane a drawing, he would give her an authentic photograph, taken by him, and he would be her hero. She would forget everything about how he accidentally outed her to her mother. Maybe. The more he thought about the whole thing, the more foolish he felt going to this length, but again, teenage love was about feeling, not thinking. He was in the depths of the forest and positioned the fake cryptid in the camera so that the body was turned to a silhouette and the duct tape was thus hidden. He knew just enough about photography that he wanted to take at least a dozen or more shots and choose the best ones. He was also lazy and shot most of them from the same spot. This had an unexpected result. He spent the evening poring over the mostly identical pictures, deciding which ones to give to Jane. Eh, maybe he would use a cool filter or something and make them look like bloody movie posters. He ended up including all the photos, plus ones that he edited with effects. He put everything on a flash drive and looked at it like it was a magic ring that would cast a love spell on whoever wore it. Part 3 Jane was back in school on Monday, looking nerve-worn and stressed. Jacob felt a pang of guilt when he saw her at her locker. He braced himself before going up to her and offering the flash drive. Hey, he said. She took one look at him and turned her back on him. Look, look, I'm really sorry my drawing upset your mom. Jane turned around with eyes that were perfect circles. You mean... That was you that came to my house? He hadn't considered that her mom would have been too worked up to supply a proper description of the man that exposed the apparently underground interests of her daughter. Jane looked fit to slug him. He wasn't going to get the flowery lead-ins that he'd hoped for, so he went for it. I've got photos of Peg Lake Peggy. They're on this flash drive. She eyed the thing, looked at him. I've never done anything to you. I don't even know you. Why do you feel the need to make fun of me and wreck my life? I'm serious. I took these pictures myself. I don't know you. Why are you doing this? She said, with tears forming translucent pearls in her eyes. I... I wanted to impress you. That got her attention. Was she going to throw her arms around him and kiss him now? No. She just took the flash drive and looked it over looked at him the way a wild squirrel regards a hiker offering a peanut. What's really on here? She said. I told you. Pictures of Peg Leg Peggy. I noticed that she's your favorite... um... thing. That's why I drew you a picture of her. I... I just wanted to impress you. You would have thought that he told her that he was trying to grow a third armpit. Just look them over and tell me what you think. I, uh phone number and EMR address are on there too. She took the drive and walked off without a word. It was not the scene from a modern romance novel that he had hoped for, but it could have gone worse. Now, I would love to tell you that things went exactly as he had hoped for after that, but no. His email pinged with a message from Jane Pegg at famnet.net, and his heart was shot down just as soon as it had been taken to the sky. It was a long, Nasty, scathing message. To the effect that he must really think she's stupid, and he must really want her dead and really hate her. He was going to make a hasty reply, but she had blocked his email address. That was it. He failed. He didn't eat dinner that night. Told everyone that his stomach was bothering him, which was partially the truth. He laid in bed but couldn't nap. The sun went down, but he couldn't sleep. 
He just garnered what meager painkiller he could from the dopamine release of playing a game on his cell phone. It was around midnight when his email pinged again. It was from Jane. We need to talk. Beneath that terse line was an animated gif made up of the photos that Jacob had taken. He almost thought that she was making fun of him, but he noticed something in the background of the gif. He had taken the pictures no more than two seconds apart, and the gif made it look like a cut from an amateur stop-motion film. Behind the fake peg-like Peggy was the real thing. She was nestled in the leaves, mostly holding still, except to shift her weight on her sticks and to slowly stalk away, keeping her eyes on the camera until her neck wouldn't turn. It was beyond belief in that moment. Was it an act of God? Was Jacob really such a G that he made things work out so well without knowing it? Either way, he was going to take it. He replied to her email and waited. She was waiting for him in the cafeteria. The anger and the distrust were gone from her eyes. Hey, he said. Hey, she patted the spot on the table next to her. He couldn't hide how happy he was to sit next to her. She didn't share the glow. Instead, she wore the look of an addict trying to hide their hunger for a fix. Can you show me where you took those pictures? Sure can. Do you still have the mannequin? He frowned internally. Why wasn't she talking about dating? I took it home with me after I was done taking pictures, so... Yeah. Why? Did you see the way that she acted? She wasn't looking at you. She was looking at the mannequin. That was territorial behavior. If we set it up again, it could draw her out and we could get better pictures. She was looking intense, like something important hinged on her ideas. Will you be able to get away from your parents without getting in trouble? Yeah, <laughs> don't worry about that. So, it was a date. She just didn't know it. Or didn't seem to care. Part 4 Jacob waited in the exact same spot with his prize mannequin cryptid. He was grinning ear to ear and he felt amazing. It all seemed too good to be true. She was going to be here with him alone in the woods. He brought snacks and drinks. They were going to photograph a local legend and he was going to win her heart in the process. Perfect. So perfect. He tried to suppress his anxiety when she took her time to show up. Part of him wondered if she had stood him up to get revenge. But there she came at long last, wearing nothing remarkable but looking stunning to him all the same. Her golden hair looked at home among the leaves that were changing colors into the hues of autumn. Love in the fall. Falling in love, he mused. He grinned at her like an idiot. Hey, she greeted him without making eye contact. Is the decoy set up yet? In about ten minutes they were ready. Faux Peggy was where she was the first time. The two youths were poised with their equipment. Jacob made sure that they would be able to camp out long after dark, just not for the same reason that Jane had in mind. Jane looked like an overprepared tourist who was lugging around half a studio. She had her own camera, a laptop, plus her cell phone at the ready. Her face was stern like a grim Mona Lisa. A good hour passed before there was much talking. It was actually her that broke the silence as the two of them sat on a storm-fallen tree, leaves falling around them like snowflakes. This means everything to me, she said, rather matter-of-fact. I can tell, Jacob said. I mean, this is my future. My mother thinks I want to be some kind of ghost chaser or demon hunter. If I can just show my mother that this thing is real and not some demon, I'll be one step closer to doing what I want to do with my life. Hard evidence is the best argument, right? Oh, sure, Jacob said as his hand started inching towards hers. Her face scrunched slightly as if she were seeing a naked tarantula sneaking up on her. She looked at him. So, what's your favorite real-life monster? She asked as she moved her hand to where her other one was. Bigfoot? Really? His eyes danced. 
The Loch Ness Monster? She looked away to hide the smile that was coming on. He saw it. He couldn't tell if it was due to amusement or ridicule. But it was a smile. From her. And he loved it. So, what do you know about the monster we're looking for right now? Uh, it's been popping up around here for the last 60 years. I guess it eats children? When kids go missing, it gets blamed. The name Peggy Pegleg is a reference to Peg Powler, a very old water spirit who is also said to eat children. Well, that made her smile for real. You've done some research. Yeah, just for this monster, though. Just for me? He nodded. Yeah, just for you. Was he dreaming, or did she finally look like she could actually tolerate his presence and possibly enjoy it? For me, there's more to this than just leaving my mark in paranormal research. This monster speaks to me on some level. Somewhere in there, she's human, but she's altered. You'd think her chances of survival would be nada, but here she's been a legend for decades. She's surviving despite her odds. She hasn't felt the need to ask for help. She's obviously misunderstood, and I really, really, really identify with that. And so the cork popped and Jane's backlog of self-expression came spilling out. The hours wore on, and the two teens talked for most of it, sometimes forgetting what they were there to do. It got dark. It got cold. They didn't really notice. Jane woke up to the pitch black of the night, the sky retaining just enough twilight to contrast slightly with the canopy of leaves. He fumbled for the oil lantern with heavy, sleep-drugged hands. He lit it. Jane appeared next to him, passed out and snoring. He thought it was absolutely adorable. Movement at the very edge of the lantern's halo caught his attention. His heart nearly stopped beating. Jane, Jane, he hissed, shaking her with one hand. She woke with a start. What? 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 What's happening? She said. And then she saw it. Half a second later... Just past the fake peg leg Peggy was the real one. She had been studying the decoy, but the lantern got her attention. Her movements resembled a praying mantis, sizing up a potential meal. She creaked side to side on her sticks in a hypnotic rhythm. Her red eyes had a fire to them, as if they would glow if the lantern went out. Jane's hands went to her face. Jake had the presence of mind to start recording with his camera on the tripod. Jane seemed to have forgotten all about her own equipment. She stood up. The monster didn't back up, but her shoulders crept up next to her ears like a shrinking cat. Jake got up with the lantern and held it high, casting the horrid appearance of Peggy into even sharper clarity. She looked like she spent her years being used as a dartboard covered in cuts and scrapes and festering wounds. The yeasty stink of pus reached the teens. She was awfully thin, both from hunger and from wiry strength. The filthy hair hung straight down, and the movements of the head had an almost reptilian way about them. Especially clear was the mouth, a slit that ran from under one earlobe to another. If it truly indicated her capacity for opening her jaws, then the idea of her devouring small children was not far-fetched. She could probably engulf rabbits and squirrels whole. Jane took a few slow steps forward, and Peggy bristled with warning. But the mouth stayed shut. It's okay. I won't hurt you. Can you understand me? Jane said. Peggy tilted her head like a dog, eliciting a smile from Jane. We want to learn about you. We want to get to know you. People tell stories about you. We want to know what your story really is. Peggy tilted her head to the other side. Can you talk at all? Hey, Jake, are you getting this? I'm getting everything. Okay, um, yes. We want to know what your story is. You see, everyone has a story, 
Peg's mouth flared wider than a hawk's wingspan and she galloped toward Jane. Jacob reacted in the blink of an eye. The blunt ends of Peg's arms jabbed into Jane's shoulders as she was tackled by the stinking, gritting predator. Jake struck her with a kick to the side of her head, enough to knock her onto her back. He helped Jane up and commanded her to run. He mentally went through the contents of the backpack he was wearing and cursed himself for not bringing any means of defense. They had a good start, but Peg was already galloping like some sort of bizarre deer, enclosing the distance between them. Her mouth gaped open, like a demonic basking shark. She leapt and caught the heel of Jacob this time, just enough to make him stagger and fall. The oil lantern dashed against a nearby rock and erupted into flames. He rolled onto his back just in time for his abdomen to sustain the blunt force trauma of Peggy's arms as she took another flying leap and impaled him in the stomach. No flesh was punctured, but the pounds per square inch was agony for his internal organs. He was just able to slide his knees up between his stomach and the monster and plant his feet firmly against her chest and sent her flying onto her back. He anchored his hands to get up and found something round like a cylinder. Half a second of comprehension took him, and a light bulb went off in his head. He got up, stood behind the fireball that the oil lamp had become, and waited. Peg writhed herself back on her stilts just in time to get a face full of fire. Jacob had taken the container of lamp oil that had rolled out of his backpack and thrown it through the fire at her, an improvised flamethrower. A painful squeal wrecked the ears of the two teens as Peggy was engulfed. There was no recovering from that one. It was a direct hit. The monster's rage drove it to chase after the teens again and they fled, but they didn't need to run far. The fire overwhelmed the monster, but they were too busy running for their lives to notice. They ran until they couldn't run anymore. They could see the streetlights of civilization ahead. They looked back at where they had come from, looked at each other. The camera, she said between gasps. We can go back and get it later. I'm sorry for having to attack her. Jane didn't reply. They agreed to go back early in the morning tomorrow, Sunday and retrieve the camera. If she couldn't get past her parents, he would do it by himself. Part 5 Fire Marshal James Baldwin got a phone call at about one in the morning. There was a raging forest fire in a remote corner of the woods that surrounded Stocksville, and it had progressed to apocalyptic proportions before anyone had called it in. After all, everyone was in for the night not doing community fire watch. Now, the night sky was a hellish orange, and eye-watering smoke was omnipresent. The local fire department was woefully inadequate, so firefighters from neighboring counties were called out in the dead of night. The fire would be out of control for three long days. It claimed well over 90% of the forest, a good chunk of one of Stocksville's upper-class neighborhoods, revealing how shoddy those expensive homes really were, due to how quickly they went up in the flames, and rendered a church unfit for use for the foreseeable future. A black metal-loving Satanist teen tried to take credit for that so he could say it was done with his black magic, but it didn't stick after Jacob came forward and accepted responsibility. At the Stocksville police station, the room that they took Jacob into was small and quiet as a tomb. He could hear the tinnitus in his ears. He was also with a female officer, with dark red hair and chestnut eyes that were exotropic, causing her to stare around him rather than at him. You have a story for me, Mr. Pines, the officer said without introduction. He told her everything, except he edited out the presence of Jane at the incident of the fire. She looked at him for a long moment before sliding a few photographs in front of him. They were black and white, so it took him a moment to realize what he was seeing. Once it hit him, you would have thought that his hair would turn white. They were taken with PD equipment, shots of a badly burned female body that had no arms or legs and a monstrously wide mouth that hung open. You found her? Jacob croaked. This is the only reason you're not being arrested right now, she stated flatly. Jacob breathed a sigh of relief. He would find out that it was premature. 
The local media converged on Jacob. They were as interested in his account of the monster as they were about the price on his head from locals. For weeks to come, there would be reporters saying the same thing over and over, with the scarred town in the background, Jacob's face appearing in a small square on the corner of the screen. A teenager from Stocksville is making history in more ways than one. He has accepted responsibility for starting what is considered the town's worst disaster in decades. But it was all in self-defense from an attack that has led to the first truly solid evidence of stranger things that walk this earth. He was handling the cocktail of fame and notoriety rather well, better than Jane would have. They kept in touch via email and he promised that he wouldn't hog all the glory. She'd get involved when it was safe. It was the biggest bouquet of flowers he could ever offer her. And that was the highlight of the whole thing. Someone else was going to be famous. He just didn't know it yet. Harold Redshore, the mortician that would examine and prepare the monster's remains for long-term storage. He slid it out of the freezer and furrowed his brow under his pocked moon of a forehead. He would almost think it was fake if it weren't for the wounds. It was so human and yet so devoid of typical human female features. It had to have been the last of its kind. It couldn't procreate, as it had no visible reproductive system, nor did it have a means of nursing young. Apparently, a new species was born with it, and a new species died with it. He picked up a scalpel just before Peggy lurched upwards and wrapped her mouth around Harold's head, completely taking it in and clamping down hard. She twisted her neck and the muffled pop of Harold's vertebrae sounded in her throat. Her limbs grew new wood out of their burned stumps. Her hair would grow back eventually. First things first, her wide-eyed head bobbed around like a mutant chicken until she saw the stairwell. She ran up them and knocked the screen door out of an open window and ran into the cool night. Why does every grim detective story start out with? It was a dark and stormy night. If crime was really preceded by rain, then we'd live in a water world. Well, this far into my solo career as a private eye, I think that the dark and stormy night isn't always literal. There's a lot of dark clouds that try to suffocate you from ever seeing the light again. The light at the end of the tunnel. The light in people's faces when a case is finally put to rest. The light of happier times for yourself. Sure, there are moments when you're a hero. But more often, you're just helping to clean up the bigger crime scene, with all the broken emotions and injustices that nobody sees in the chalk line on the TV screen. I'm Chloe Shandell. This is my fourth year as a private investigator with the Wilson Agency. This means I can count on one hand how many big cases I've handled. The rest are just a means of keeping myself on the payroll. People don't understand why a 20-something woman would want to work in a field that ages you ahead of schedule. Part of it is that I like the challenge. When there's a challenge. I'll admit that I thought I'd be getting better work than this on the regular. The other part is that it's one of those things you just don't know what you're getting into until you're in. There's no point in backing out after that line has been crossed. Does that sound depressing? Yeah. Yeah. So every night is a dark and stormy night. The phone had been quiet for a few days longer than usual. It caught me by surprise when it finally made some noise. Hello? I said with my pulse picking up. Chloe, how you doing? It's Mavis at Wilson's office. My heart dropped. Hi, Mavis. Just touching bases because, you know, it looks like you haven't taken on any for a minute. I don't think you want my word depending on you speech. A drop in crime is a good thing, Mavis. Bad for us, but good for the world. Crime ain't done, though. Oh, please, we want to keep you. Think about me the next time a case comes your way, alright? Mavis hung up without waiting for my answer. Well then... I hadn't taken up the drinking crutch that everyone thinks I'm supposed to have. 
but I was getting closer to understanding how one gets it. I did keep a little something-something under my desk, and I won't lie. It was starting to taste more like medicine than fun. I drummed my nails on my desk as I weighed the decision. My thoughts were broken off by a shadowy movement behind the clouded glass of my door, followed by a knock. It's not locked, I called out. A woman opened the door just wide enough to slip through. Her eyes seemed to be checking corners for threats. I guessed her to be close to my age, but she wore some shroud of anxiety that aged her at the moment. Don't be shy. The good guys work here, I said. I used that line a lot. I believed it a little less each time I said it. She was hunched over with folded hands and she shuffled over to one of the empty chairs in front of my desk. An opportunistic light bulb went off in my brain. Nerves, huh? She nodded. Do you drink? I asked. Yes. Green light. I found a couple of glass tumblers, and soon they had ice cubes soaking in amber. She thanked me, and I silently thanked her. Well, um, I'm Mandy. I lifted my glass to her. Hi, Mandy. I'm Chloe. What you got for me? She tapped her fingertips together briefly, shaking her head. My daddy has disappeared. Sort of. She had my attention. Okay. He checked himself into Bright Dawn Wellness Center about three weeks ago. We run a bakery, and I think the stress of the business was getting to him. He didn't tell you? No, it was very sudden. I mean, I knew he was under a lot of pressure, and I thought we were handling it pretty well. Like a family. What's the last thing you've heard from him? Well, that's just it. I haven't heard anything. It's been zero contact ever since he went there. What do the staff say? Well, they act like they have no idea who I'm talking about. I've called them a million times and talked myself blue in the face. I gave them his name, address, social security number, his description down to his birthmarks, and they don't budge. They don't know who he is, and they haven't seen him before. Lately, they don't even pick up the phone. I got it stuck in my head that they know more than they're telling me. So I called the police. And you know what they told me after they looked into it? They say I should check myself in too. So the cops are in on it, whatever it is. My mind was shooting off sparks. I couldn't believe a case like this just landing in my lap. A missing person? A distraught daughter? A... <laughs> psych ward with a possible agenda. Not likely, but possible. So you need him found and accounted for. She kept her eyes on her whiskey as she nodded. I'll take your case. I said with restraint. I felt that my enthusiasm would be facetious if I allowed it to show. She handed over a large envelope with enough to get me started. Photos, documentation that could establish identity, a few news clippings, mostly about the opening and ongoing success of their bakery. The kind of stuff local news covered occasionally when they were out of ideas. The direct approach hadn't done anything for either Mandy or the police, so I decided to skip it myself. Instead, I paid Bright Dawn a visit to quietly cover as many square inches as possible with my eyes. I would go after the blueprints later, but you can't get the general flavor of a place from blueprints. Private investigator is a bitter taste you need to mask as much as possible. I soon had a uniform and well-fabricated ID, if I do say so myself. It just wouldn't be able to unlock any of the sensor-locked doors. But I would figure that part out when I had to. I wanted to keep a light touch for as long as possible. Bright Dawn faced forward as a cutting-edge facility for the people unfortunate enough to need emergency psychiatric care. Personally, if I'd have been one of the people admitted there, my heart would have plummeted down into my stomach as soon as I saw what wasn't shown in a glossy brochure and reassuring video ads. Okay. It wasn't exactly the torture chamber that the old asylums were. But I couldn't help feeling that the place cared more about what the outside saw than what the inside felt. I had to remind myself that I was there to find a father. Not conduct an audit. 
but if I had been an inspector, the place would have fallen right into the palm of my hand. One sloven orderly kept her username and password out in the open, on a piece of notebook paper. Her handwriting was huge and in sharpie. I could read it a mile away. Or at least from far enough away she would have never noticed me. She also said her credentials out loud each time she logged into the system. I found an unattended terminal and got right in. Patient records weren't hard to find. I ran a search for Jerry Mendenhall and got nothing. There was a Jonas Mendenhall in his 20s, far too young. There were a lot of Jerry's, but the man I was looking for wasn't on record. I paced the halls, plotting, drawing up a card in my brain. I found the Sloven orderly and played my card with her. Hey, I've got someone on the phone that's checking on the status of Jerry Mendenhall that checked in three weeks ago. I almost thought she didn't hear me, but her fingers worked away on the keyboard until her broad head shook, sending tremors through her chins. Uh, we don't have a Jerry Mendenhall. Well, what should I tell them? He isn't here. Never was. They must have the wrong number. I tried this with several orderlies, and they each had the same answer. The sharp rebuttal of the police began to ring my ears. You should check yourself in, too. I chided myself for thinking of repeating that advice to my client. Albeit, with more finesse. But I didn't know how much deeper I could dig without stepping on some toes. If these people were sworn to secrecy, I would have seen it. They wouldn't put on an act for one of their own. Would they? I began wandering, not even sure what I was looking for. I reached a hallway that felt like a transition between two different worlds. The usual foot traffic and noise diminished as if things weren't allowed in that part of the building. Ceiling tiles were less white and sagged. The hallway terminated into a door that was protected by a sensor that required a badge to unlock. And yet there was something about that lock. I leaned in close. There were no lights, no gentle hum of electricity. There was a generous film of dust on the display. I tried the door and it opened without any resistance. I held my breath just in case the alarm was delayed. But nothing happened. There were more galleries of patient rooms, but most of them were open. Each of them had cobwebs and all the lighting was limited to the hallway. I was about to write off that entire section as abandoned and my mission as a bust. But then I heard it. Singing. It was a mumbling and rambling tune. Certainly the work of the mad. But I couldn't fathom how that part of the building, why that part of the building, would be an active use for patient care. I followed the sound around a distant corner and jerked back. An orderly was unlocking three enormous padlocks that were clamped around an equally heavy chain. It was wound through several brackets that kept a door anchored shut. The chain and the locks fell into a heap on the floor. The door opened and a lunatic laughter spilled out. But the orderly turned her back on the unguarded door and wheeled the dining cart inside. Time for dinner, Mr. Curry. The occupant replied with rapid chittering. Time slowed down for me as my heart rate sped up. I saw the key sticking out of one of the padlocks. I felt my own keys in my pocket. One for my apartment, one for my office, and one for my mailbox. I never got anything good in the mail, so I took out my mail key and went for the padlock key. I withdrew it with nothing louder than a gentle snick. I placed my own key on the floor. I got the briefest glance of the occupant through the door, and it made the whole job worthwhile. It was definitely Mr. Mendenhall. I was pretty sure that he saw me as well. I held my breath for the consequence that never came. I retreated back behind my corner and waited. I pictured the orderly questioning if she had left the key by itself like that but then shrugged it off as the chain echoed through the stillness and the three padlocks clicked into place. I slinked back to the active portion of the building where the staff was starting to thin out for the evening hours. I got back into the patient records and searched the last name Curry. There was only one, admitted about three weeks ago. The full-color photo was a match to what Mandy had given me. But all the patient information... He hadn't just checked himself in under an alias... He had used an entirely fabricated identity. That's not the work of an insane man. It was something he had planned in advance. My eyes were drawn to the hallway that would take me to the exit. 
I had what I came for. But then I looked in the general direction of the derelict part of the building. Hiding in a psychiatric facility is not a casual move. I had to be sure about, well, the ethics of what I was doing. No amount of finesse prevented the padlocks and the chain from sounding like fireworks. But I got inside of his room, and I was arrested on sight. Every square inch of the room was covered in colorful clay sculptures, handcrafted and hand-painted. They were all some variation of cake, but in the most mind-bendingly creative ways. It was like the set to some children's television show. There were castles made of cake, the guard tower's pointed cones of frosting. Trees with pink cotton candy foliage bore colorful sprinkles instead of fruit. Lollipops and candies sprouted in place of flowers. Even more overwhelming were the figurines. It seemed that no two were alike. Their bodies were cookies and cupcakes that sprouted cherubic faces and limbs. Their hats were every sort of dessert. Think strawberry shortcake, ultra cake edition. And you had this room down to a T. Mr. Mendenhall was down on all fours play-acting with some of the figurines. It was an act of dialogue as if he were rehearsing for a recorded show. The fudge dragon almost got us, but we're too smart for him! You can say that again. Okay, the fudge dragon... Shut up, cheesecake for brains. We need to prepare the dragon's egg for the grand banquet. What's the rush? The dragon can't find us here. But she who cuts the cake might. Not so loud. Mr. Mendenhall put every bit of character into their lines. But I didn't have the time to spare. I carefully stepped over the sprawling displays of trees and villages and approached him. Mr. Mendenhall, I'm Chloe Shandell. Your wife has hired me to find out if you're in here. He froze and looked at my feet. He stared as if I was invisible. How did she know the dragon's name? What? I said. The name of the dragon is a secret nobody in the kingdom knows, and she knows it. It's a sign. No, no, don't talk like that. But it's true, and you know it. She who cuts the cake must be near, for this is a messenger. Who else could it be? I studied the scene. His figurines were continuing to chat. He wasn't breaking character. I considered. I threw open the door a look before I knelt down beside him. I took one of the figurines. A blonde girl with an ice cream sandwich for a body and I jumped in. Hey, I'm looking for Mr. Jerry Mendenhall, I squeaked. He had every character hiss the same thing. Don't speak the name of the fudge dragon. It means the end times are at hand. What end times? I replied. You know, when she who cuts the cake comes, she will divide the great world cake into a million slices, and happy cake land will be no more. Oh no! All the other figurines chimed. There was a spark in my head when he said Happy Cake Land. That was the name of the bakery mentioned in the news clippings from Mandy. I wasn't going to get any more answers from Mr. Mendenhall, but I had plenty of more questions. He let me leave without incident. I locked him back up and left the building. First thing in the morning, I was at Happy Cake Land. The style of the place was a spitting image of Mr. Mendenhall's miniatures. Undeniably his work. The man must have been a prolific sculptor. Mandy was behind the counter and I never forgot how startled she was to see me. She smiled, but her eyes didn't. Chloe, I didn't expect to see you here. Quite a place you've got here. It's a work of art, actually. A feast for the eyes and the stomach. Jerry, Daddy could make anything with his hands. Do you have any news for me? We grabbed a table and I spilled everything. I could see the gears turning in her head, but she wouldn't show any of her cards. Do you have any idea why your father would fabricate a thoroughly false identity? No, uh, but I know he's play-acting. Happy Cake Land was a story he was going to pitch as a television show. Daddy always planned for it and had written scripts and everything. 
but he just took his time getting around to making it happen. He was always holding back. It became the inspiration for the bakery. She said with a sweeping gesture at our surroundings. Business looks really good, I said with genuine awe. Why do you think he felt the need to check himself in? Was that a warning that flashed in her eyes? It was gone as soon as I had noticed it. Well, even good business can take its toll. Day in and day out with a small crew, the bulk of everything is done by him and I. I tell you what, you might get more out of him if his story has to end. I beg your pardon? I know the story he was telling himself. Come over here. She took me into a room with metal shelving. Every square inch occupied by boxes of some kind. She produced a figurine that looked like it was missing from the set that Mr. Mendenhall was playing with. It should have been Morticia Adams, but her black decorum consisted of an apron and measuring spoons hanging from the strings. A great round strawberry adorned her head. She held a long knife in one hand. This is the character that will cut the cake, or whatever, and trigger the end of the world. At least the end of his story. I mean, if his story ends, then maybe he'll come and talk to you more directly. I felt ridiculous even considering where this was going. You hired me to find out where he was and I did. What would be the point of going back inside to deliver this? Chloe, I'm not going to get in there in a million years. He checked himself in. If the story ends, then maybe the spell will break and he will find his way out. This wasn't part of the agreement. I'll need to charge extra. Done. Name your price, just... please. I accepted the assignment and the figurine. I walked out the door, considering what the best time would be to slip back inside a bright dawn and make the delivery, and possibly get my mail key back. I stopped by my office to gather my thoughts. I plopped down in my chair, which seemed to groan under the extra weight of my nerves. Huh. Nerves. I wasn't the anxious type. I held out one of my hands in front of me, and sure enough, my fingers were trembling. That was new. I had heard about the way stress and burnout can sneak up on a person. I quietly decided that I would take the rest of the day off. It was only noon. I slouched back against my chair. I can't quite put into words the way I feel anxiety worming through the floor and up in my legs. It wasn't something I was used to. I was the type to be in control of how I felt, mind over matter, and yet my body had decided that it had a mind of its own. I took out the bottle of whiskey and hastily gathered some ice into the tumbler from the day before. The euphoria of the alcohol spread through my veins. I waited for my racing pulse to fade away. It didn't. In fact, it only got faster. My thoughts spun in circles, frequently coming back to the job I was stuck in. I couldn't afford to wait another day. Not in that condition. I made up my mind that I would go back to bright dawn that very evening. And you know what? That's when my levels started to taper off. I also thought I saw something move out of the corner of my eye. It was just my coat on a hook. I shook my head, eager for nightfall. I waited until the evening, though I could scarcely wait. I expected some kind of resistance, someone to spot me, but nope. I must have been crazy, because it felt even easier than last time. People seemed to just get out of my way and clear the halls so I could pass without interruption. The figurine in my pocket felt heavier the closer I got. I was definitely going to bed when I got this whole thing over with. I made it to Mr. Mendenhall's oversized playroom. He didn't react to me, but he did react to the figurine. I don't know why I expected him to recoil from it. He stared for a long moment and reached out with tears in his eyes. He held it out at an arm's length and gazed as if he had been reunited with a long-lost loved one. I think the word for what I saw in his face was finality. But he still wasn't going to answer my questions. I figured he needed time to transition from wherever he was back to reality, and I needed to get out before anyone discovered an unauthorized occupant in this room. When I stepped outside, all of the tension left my body at once like a spirit being cast out. I almost lost my balance. I felt so unburdened that it was unreal. But on another level... I felt a creeping dread. The feeling you get when you've done something wrong, but you just don't fully know it. 
what had I actually done anyway? I delivered a figurine to its original owner in the hopes that it would get him to snap back to reality and get him back to his daughter and his business. There was something more, and my senses wouldn't let it lie. I drove over to the bakery hoping that Mandy was there. I would tell her that I did the job and that I had some questions eating at me, even though I had no idea what those questions were. She wasn't there. I couldn't accept that. I had to know, and I had to know right then and there. I held my phone screen up to the lock for just enough light. I could easily pick the lock, but maybe I didn't have to. I had found the spare key in a faux rock in 30 seconds. I let myself in and shone the LED of my phone around. A man has the luxury of not only a successful business, but the full-time support of his daughter, and enough creative energy to transform the building into a work of art. And then he checks himself into the funny farm because he's stressed? Madness might not be subject to logic, but that wasn't a recuperating man I saw isolated in that room. He was hiding. I had to know why. I located the room chock full with boxes. There were tons of business records and legal papers. Most of them were older, before the world went mostly digital. Then I noticed that one of the shelving units was on wheels. This stood out because none of the other shelves had wheels. Sure enough, there was a door behind it. I opened it, and the rabbit hole yawned wide to swallow me whole. One box was full of pictures. Mandy had the same face even in childhood. But the man that was by her side with what appeared to be her mother, I couldn't place it as Mr. Mendenhall. There was a professionally taken photo of the entire family with the same couple holding Mandy up high. I knew age can change a man, but surely not to such an extreme. On the back of the photo was a stranger piece of the puzzle, the words, Sutton family. I eventually found some pictures of Mandy with a man that looked more like Mr. Mendenhall, but she looked to be 12 or 13 in those photos. The nearly bottomless pile of other photos didn't provide any context. I had almost given up until at the very bottom of the catch-all box of photos, I found a small diary. It was quite worn and seemed to be meant for small hands. In there I found photos crammed between the pages, mostly of Mandy. But they didn't look right. She had a spacey, vacant look when her eyes were in the shot. Her clothes looked like she had been struggling with them. She was topless in one too many pictures, just beginning to transition from child to woman. I suppose I began to smell what I was going to uncover, but my conscious mind wouldn't accept it at first. It was too disgusting to look in the face. My mental gaze was like Mandy's in the photos, staring far off in any direction except straight on. The diary told of the really nice man, Jerry Mendenhall, how he made her feel special like a princess. The things he had bought her for her 13th birthday. The time he would spend with her while Daddy was busy. Then the entry suddenly got short, like two or three sentences long. They were like dry documentation, or notes that were supposed to be fleshed out later but never were. They told of how he had touched her and where, when he did it again. Once or twice she wrote of how she told him she didn't want to be touched like that. But he didn't listen. He kept touching her and she kept writing about it. The last entry was a date with the words married. Amanda Catherine Mendenhall. A thinning copy of a marriage certificate was between the pages. Whoever Jerry Mendenhall was, he was not Mandy's father. Two things happened. First... I realized that I was holding my breath. Second, I realized that I could hear voices, indoors, with me. It was blurry chatter with no pauses. My deepest instinct screamed to me that I needed to get out. Instead, I was magnetized to the source of the whispering, wherever it was. And I had to find it. I stumbled into a small kitchen where there was a large cookbook resting on a counter. It was surrounded by a crowd of Mr. Mendenhall's figurines. The whispering was the loudest there, but where was it coming from? The eeriness sent ripples across my skin, and yet I was compelled to keep looking. My light passed over the pages of the cookbook. These weren't recipes scrawled on those pages. They weren't written in the English alphabet. 
and each bizarre, otherworldly, fiendish illustration was a punch to my brain that left me stunned. I felt my blood freeze in place when the lights of the bakery began to flicker. At first, I thought that someone had turned them on, as if an attempt to catch me like a burglar. But the light strobed and flashed. A short circuit? What if it would end in a fire? That would be even worse. Then I'd have to call emergency services and explain myself. But when I looked through the doorway, there was no familiar outline of either Mandy or a uniformed officer. If I hadn't been holding the knife, my brain would have never accepted the possibility of what I was seeing. The figurine that I had left with Mr. Mendenhall had somehow grown to lifelike proportions. The lights, no matter which direction they threw their rays, never truly illuminated the inky black figure in front of me, with its larger-than-life hat, sleek dress and apron, and exaggerated footwear. In its hand was the wicked shape of the knife, also robed in shadow. The swirling voices began to speak in unison. She's returned, she's returned, they chanted. Deed is done, deed is done, we will be set free. Darkness. The light strobe revealing that the figure was now closer to me. Darkness. Light. Even closer. The thing's progression towards me was revealed in harrowing snapshots. I tried to contain the scream that was collecting in my throat. The figure stood between me and any available exits. One last flash revealed the knife held high, poised to strike like the tail of a scorpion. I waited for the sharp pain. But there wasn't a soft sound of flesh meeting iron. There was the thunk of a carpenter's workshop, not a butcher's, metal and wood. I trembled from head to toe, barely daring to breathe. There was the sound of something like a sigh taking place all around me. As if I had been standing in a circle of people that had been holding their breath and could hold it no longer. Then the room was truly still. My phone created a shivering light that rested on the figurine's life-size knife. The figurine itself was gone. The blade protruded from the wooden table that held the small figurines. An absurd amount of blood flowed down from the knife and touched the toys. At the precise points where the ruby liquid touched them, faint wisps of vapor were visible just long enough for me to see them. Then they were gone. The toys seemed familiar somehow. More still, inert, than they were before. Emptier than before. My churning thoughts created a ringing in my skull, but I had to focus on the most immediate necessity. Get out of there. From that moment on, another nameless knot settled into my stomach where it would gestate. Nameless, though it was, it developed a face. It hit the news that a patient at bright dawn had been butchered in the night, and the killer slipped in and out without a trace. It was the news report that I had been expecting, but that I couldn't have imagined was possible. It took me more than a few days, and more than one bottle of whiskey, to get a grip. I didn't know how I was going to go about it, but I needed to make Mandy pay for what she had done. Whatever unholy measure she had resorted to, she was the killer, and she had duped me into facilitating the kill. But in the time that I took to recuperate, she was gone. The bakery was closed, with a note of eventually returning upon an unspecified date. I tried telling myself that I had ultimately served the greater good. Mr. Mendenhall would have gone on the rest of his life with his prize catch, keeping her in the confines of whatever neurotic, cake-filled fantasy he had in his head. I tried telling myself that I had finally been a real hero. The truer the heroism, the less recognition it gets. The less you can actually talk about it in the open. Yeah, that's what I tried to tell myself. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. 